that's a beautiful image. Yeah. Don't ask me what it is. Yeah, I wanted to ask. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's. I think it's just some cross section of a plant. Right. Okay, all right, everyone. I hope you can hear me. So welcome everyone to this Physics of Life Symposium. It's uh, nine o'clock local time, so let's get started. So thank you everyone for, for signing up and for being here. Um, it's, um, we basically only organized this uh, very recently and advertised this only very locally. Um, so it's um, it's nice to have um, roughly 100 people sign up, and I hope uh, many of them can join now in the next few minutes. Um, so I'm Robert Endres. I'm one of the organizers of this um, symposium, and I'm also the director of this Physics of Life Network at Imperial College. Let me also quickly introduce uh, co-organizers, Shufan Lee and Chris Dunsby. Um, if you're here, can you just say hi quickly? Hi there, morning. Okay. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Good. Good That's Chris and Chufan. <laughs> um, and I also wanted to so say organize or say uh, moderate the uh, second and third session. So I would also like to uh, say some thanks in particular to Sarah Lamas, Oliviera Marquez, and um, Suel Islam for helping with the organization of this meeting, and also to Imperial College for funding the network. So um, yeah, let me say it's really exciting to, to do this. Um, we haven't done any of these virtual meetings before. This is really an experiment and it's uh, super exciting. And in particular, how easy it is to reach so many people um, through these virtual conferences. So that's really fantastic. And um, so we have nine speakers or eight speakers besides me. And so I think this is quite an exciting program. So most speakers are from our Imperial College network. But we also have some speakers from uh, collaborating universities or institutions across London. And um, so what we did here, we wanted to um, we wanted to give um, our speakers a provocative assignment to uh, talk about their, their big ideas and motivations to what's a, what, what motivated them to do their research instead of giving these very detailed research talks. I think this format works quite well for virtual conferences. And so the format, what we have here is 15 plus five minutes for the PI speaker. So there's the seven talks and then 12 plus three minutes for the two PhD student talks. Um, so note also, and you see, I think the little um, uh, icon at the top. So we are recording the meeting and we're gonna try to make this then available um, on our network website as well on our YouTube channel. And um, yeah, so except for the speakers and the chairs, please mute your microphones and turn off your camera. And um, uh, and then if you have questions, use a little uh, chat function at the bottom to submit questions. And then the moderators or chairs can can pick some of these. Hopefully, hey Gunnar, we can um, they can submit these questions then, and we can uh, pick up some of these during the question and answer session. So, um, so yeah, I don't want to waste any more time. Um, uh, let's get started. So I think you're seeing Gunnar now, but um, I want to get started now with um, uh, Angela Sarek from uh, University uh, College London. And so she got her PhD from University of Columbia in New York in 2013. And then uh, she was a postdoc at um, University of Cambridge and then later became group leader at UCL. And so she's very well known for her simulations of equilibrium and non-equilibrium assembly, um, self-assembly. So over to you, Angela. Thanks a lot, Robert. And thank you for organizing this wonderful meeting to all the three organizers. I will need to ask about my presentation. Can you see it? Can you see the slides? Yes. It is yes. perfect. So then I'll just 
Tartan, I'll actually say first. Thank you for showing up, everyone, uh, at this early time. Um, today, I'll speak about something that excites um, my group, people in my group, that's uh, assembly, protein assembly. I did say I was going to speak from living to not living and back, but then I realized it's only 15 minutes, so it's just going to be about the living side. So proteins, as you know, make our bodies. It's quite amazing how they spontaneously come together, jiggle by thermal fluctuations, and self-assemble into higher order structures such as fibrils, networks, and so on. And of course, that builds um, us, that builds our hair, skin, bones, also at a lower cellular level, that builds, for instance, uh, filaments here in um, yellow and blue that gives that gives shape and support to the cell, like cytoskeleton, that also builds membranes and compartments within the cell. But in the recent years, what kind of started exciting us even more is that not only it builds materials that have exquisite um, material properties, but it actually builds machines. So here you see protein filaments that constantly assemble and disassemble here in green, for instance, and enable cells to move, enable cells to divide. And for this, you need to have assembly, but you also need to have disassembly powered by energy. And I think this is a key when considering nanomachines. So assembly is equally important to disassembly. And that's why we need constant energy input to have this thermodynamic cycle. And in fact, to know when protein assembly occurs without energy consumption, that leads to pathologies such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and so on. And I guess in my lab, what we're trying to understand is how can you come a bunch of dead molecules, which are by definition dead, then put some energy in and make them do work, make them make us alive. And as in any machine, of course, you need this assembly to be timely, you need the fuel to be added in the right form at the right place at the right time. So what we try to do is build models of how protein assembly is coupled with energy consumption to yield work. And so this occurs at a scale that's above individual molecules because you need many, many molecules to come together and give you an assembly. But also you need to retain the granularity of individual building blocks. So you're kind of below the continuum scale. And this sort of problem falls right in between of traditional approaches in modeling biology. So it's above individual molecules, in, above, let's say, individual uh, dynamics and structure or all studies of individual molecules, but it's below continuum representations of cells and tissues. So to target the scale, what we do, we develop minimal coarse grain models where building blocks are described by very simple shapes and retain only the key information and the effective interactions between building blocks and effective shape, such that we can simulate a large number of those coming together, um, changed by some energy input, and then measure the same things you would measure kind of at a continuum scale. And of course, we apply this problem to a bunch of uh, different, which uh, apply this uh, strategy to a bunch of different problems. Today I'll speak only one, but just a side note, if you're curious about what these models are, they're really just beads and springs. So I will not go into details, but happy to answer uh, specific questions later. So I guess the question is how these different building blocks and energy give you functional nanomachine, which we still don't know how to recreate in vitro. So I'll focus today only on one nanomachine. Um, a key machine that remodel, remodels our cells. So this is a beautiful, somewhat feminist representation of a cell. And of course, if somebody asked you to describe a cell, you would first say, okay, it has a border, it has a membrane, and then um, evolved cells have also internal compartments. And for it to live, it needs to take materials in and expel materials out. And that's a physical problem because it requires crossing physical barriers. It requires applying mechanical forces that will reshape these membranes. And what it took me a long time to appreciate is actually that entering is as important to exiting, and it's a very different process. Because the cell is, of course, asymmetric, all the machinery needs to be on the inside. So to enter, you need to, for the material to go from outside in, given that the machinery is on the inside, 
what you need to do is you need to cut the membrane neck from the outside. And you can imagine how you can apply mechanical force from the outside of the membrane neck and kind of cut it. But to go from inside out, you actually need to cut the neck from inside of the, ne of the membrane neck. And it's kind of weird. How do you design a nano machine from in that will cut a membrane tube from inside of the tube without getting in the way of the scission? And there's only one machine in um, the whole evolution that we know of that does uh, this job. It's called Escort. Uh, it's highly evolutionary conserved. And it participates in all these processes that require cutting of the membrane neck from inside. That's, for instance, vesicle formation, exosome formation, forming, uh, budding off viruses, but also the last step of cell division. And this is what I'll speak today about vesicle formation and cell division. So I'll tell you a bit about how this uh, machine works. So what it does, it forms um, flat fi filament spiral on the membrane. So spiral is in um, pink, it's around five, 50 nanometer in uh, radius. And it's kind of, when it's on the membrane, it doesn't do really anything, but then it binds binding partners, other proteins and an ATPase, so it consumes energy. And depending on which binding partner it binds, it can create from this flat state, it can create a downward tube, upward tube, it can cut a membrane neck and, or divide the whole cell. And in solution on its own, it forms coils. So this is taken from various papers, various experiments, but in our kind of physical view, the question is how can, this work? Like, how can you have a flat spiral filament doing all these different jobs driven by energy? And for this, we build simple models. So it's just, again, beads connected by springs adsorbed on a fluid membrane. So the first thing we learned is when the membrane, when the filament is in its flat spiral state, nothing really happens, no matter how much and how much tension you store in it, it will never deform the membrane. And the only way we could find it to create all these different shapes is if it changes global geometry from a flat spiral into a helix, out of plane helix. So basically the membrane binding phase in blue changes tilts towards the outside or inside. So if it tilts towards the outside, so you change globally spiral into helix, you'll create a downward deformation just like it's been found in experiments. The other way around, if you tilt it towards the inside, you'll create an upward deformation. So what we believe this energy input does, it, it remodels the whole filament from a spiral into a helix. And in that way, it uh, enables the spiral to do the work. But as I said, um, we're really curious about how it can cut the membrane in this way. And here we go back to this point of simultaneous assembly and disassembly. So, um, here I show you a little virus, sorry, a little model of a virus, and it's coiled on the membrane by this spiral. And when the spiral is in a flat state, nothing really happens. But when it globally changes geometry driven by energy input, it pushes this cargo uh, inside the deformation. But then when it goes back to its original state to fulfill the cycle, the membrane neck gets naturally cut because the virus the model virus can all go back. And this is kind of a first physical model that um, captured this member scission from inside the neck and the filament here gets, oops, recycled. Um, sorry, did you do this? Sorry. Uh, um, sorry. So yes, so the point was that you need to have constant cycle between flat and tilted in this case that will create scission and this was really just a physical model that's the only, the simplest physical model that we could find to put together all these different experiments. And then recently, or the group of Aurelia and Geneva actually reported cryo-EM images of these filaments where they show they actually have two membrane binding faces, kind of flat and tilted. And by switching between the two, you can create probably a membrane deformation. So this kind of fit well with our predictions from um, simulations. And then recently, actually, they had these beautiful sets of experiments. So the question is, okay, I tell you, it needs to go from flat into a helix, but how does it do that? So they had this uh, set of experiments where they showed that 
the filament is actually a heteropolymer uh, where it can have many different monomers. And then the energy input actually controls the composition of this polymer. So by starting from a homopolymer in green and replacing its monomer uh, with some uh, other type of monomers, you actually can change the filament geometry. And this is then what we um, captured also in simulation. So we try with one filament, add another one, then remove the first one. And this kind of stage assembly, and this assembly regulated by energy input, you can control the shapes of the membrane. And I mean, it, it's a true biological metamaterial that constantly kind of changes its shape. And by doing that, it produces work. And then in just in a few last minutes, I'll show you how this same filament can actually split the whole cells in two. So actually our cells inherited this filament from, an evo from evolutionary simple cells, archaeal cells. They don't have internal membranes, but they use this filament to split the whole cell in two. And these are experiments from our collaborators, Buzz Baum, where they imaged this um, evolutionary simple cells and how they're divided by the filaments. So blue is um, do you hear me still? Because um anyway, it's something yes, yes we oh, can thanks, see. sorry. <laughs> uh, blue is DNA, red is one filament. And then what happens is there's another filament polymerizing on top of this red one, which is given here in the second image. And then when the first one disappears. The, the green one somehow magically constricts the cell. So we thought what happens is that the green one that polymerizes on top of the red one probably wants to have smaller curvature but cannot acquire it because the red is there. So when the red is gone, the one that wants to have smaller curvature will somehow relax to its target state, like a relaxed spring, and split the cell. So this is precisely what we did. We started with a filament of a large curvature, and then in the same kind of spirit, we globally change its geometry to a smaller curvature. But of course, we quickly learned that you, you can constrict, but you cannot divide because filament stays there and glues two cells together. So you ne it needs to disassemble. And it's again going to the point that to have a nanomachinery that works, you need to disassemble as well as assemble. But if it's too quick of not the right timing, uh, you don't really do the job properly. And then in the right um, kind of set of parameters, if you do this protocol with the right rate, you can both constrict and divide. And actually, by showing that you need to have this assembly and going back to experiments, um, they measured uh, the amount of this protein after this assembly in cytoplasm. And of course, it goes up. So, of course, it's not surprising you need to have this assembly to create um, cell division. And then, um, just the final point what in my mind is the most valuable um, from these simulations is that we can actually match to live cell experiments and go back and forth between simulations and experiments to propose the mechanism. So what I'll show you here is in simulations, what we did is we measured the size of the cell neck in time. And then um, our collaborators did that in experiments as well, which took a long time because these archaeal cells actually live at very non-friendly conditions like 80 Celsius pH 2, so they need to develop a special microscope to do that. But um, they did manage and they measured the size of this neck as the cell divides. So I'll show you just one plot. Um, black is the experimental data and green is the measurements in our simulations of the model that I've just shown you, where a filament completely shrinks and divides the cell in this kind of tense spring way. And actually, that didn't give us. Angela, I don't think your slides are showing. Can you? Yeah, and something is up, um, jumping on my. So where where did you stop? <laughs> Should I? Is it showing now? Yeah, it's showing again. Yeah, it was frozen. Oh, sorry. Um. Anyway, this is just the last slide. So. Yes, I wanted to show the green one was this um, pen spring model. And my point here is that actually models are much more valuable when they don't match with experiments, because if they match, then they would, A, nothing would be super interesting, B, there's nothing to research. 
So then we started thinking about how we can adjust the model to still match what they see in images, but also match the dynamics that they measure in videos. And I'll just show you one more. So to match this experimental data, what we realized is that you, we cannot have kind of global instantaneous change in curvature, but it's probably stepwise, for instance, from one end and slower. And in this way, um, when we do the change in curvature, in this way, we get quite a reasonable matching with experimental data in this very simple minimal model. And I guess the value of the models is that you can test non-equilibrium protocols of biological machinery and match it to continuum data at a continuum scale in order to kind of understand how the regulation of protein assembly does work. So I'll finish here and I'll just uh, say that I hope I gave you a flavor of these very simple particle-based models and how they could bridge molecular and continuum scales. I'll thank Lena, Anne, and um, David and Tina who did the work shown here. And I'll thank also Baz and Aurelian who did the experiments uh, shown here. And I guess if you have some questions, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, hey, Angela, thank you very much. So, very good. So, just to, to, to remind everyone, so there's a chat function um, to, to submit questions. Um, it was frozen at some point, but uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, just maybe I started off with a very quick question. I think Gunnar has one as well. Um, so, there's this paradox, you know, at, at, uh, in science. So, at a microscopic scale, all the physical laws are reversible. And of course, it's what you see in these molecular dynamic simulations. But then at a larger scale, you get this irreversibility. And of course, you talk about these non-equilibrium simulations. So, so how is it then sort of implemented this irreversibility? I mean, the sort of energy consumption and, and, and so on. Can you can you say a word yeah. about it? Right. And, and if you think about it, how is it implemented in the actual cell? Um, it's implemented in conform at, at a molecular scale, it's implemented in conformational changes. Right. So that's how um at a molecular scale, energy is consumed, right? By binding and hydrolyzing nucleotides, molecules change their shape and effective interactions. And that's what then changes global properties of the assemblies. And then that's what changes the force at a global scale and so on. So in our simulations, what we do, we implement, we do short equilibrium simulation. Then we implement a step where we change the shape or the interactions of the molecule, or we cut or form bonds which is effectively what is done in, in, at the actual molecular scale. And then we continue the equilibrium simulation and then do the cycle um, multiple times. And okay. then of course, the point about non-equilibrium is that you need to do this change in a certain, with a certain protocol, right? You can, it, it needs to be at the right time at the right place. And this is what we can test in these sort of simulations. What is the protocol that will give you a functional nanomachine? Because I mean, even to build a steam engine, you need to put, energy at the right place at the right time. It's just that the nanoscale is even more complicated. We have no uh, intuition for it. Okay, sounds really good. And before I go to Gunnar, there was a question by Taron. Could you please hint towards the living and, um, sorry, could you hint towards the living to non-living part you mentioned? If you can oh, yes. make something out of this question, yeah. Right, so basically I have shown you how this protein assembly can give you a living, a machine that get, makes it alive, but you can also play the reverse game. You can um, try to look for the rules that make it go wrong and try to reproduce what's seen in an experiment. For instance, we work a lot on amyloid aggregates, which are aggregates involved in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And then we study how they form and grow and replicate. So that's a form where it kind of takes you in the other direction towards the test, but you can also study how when things go wrong by mutations or post-mutation modifications or whatever, how they pierce the cells, how you get irreversible changes, basically. Okay. And there was a question by Gunnar. Do you want to just uh, say it directly? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I um, thank you very much for the really nice talk. It was really interesting and, and really exciting. Um, I was wondering about something very similar along the lines of uh, what Robert was saying namely about the irreversibility. Um, in one slide, you were talking about um, a virus being expelled from a cell or maybe imported into the cell. I'm sorry if I didn't quite right. get the detail. Yeah. Um, but there was a, an important step, namely, where you were saying that 
the virus cannot go back. And that seems to be the irreversibility at this stage. So I wonder how is this implemented? It seems to be all reversible mechanics and it leads to something where the virus cannot go back. That sounds very irreversible to me. So can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, of course. So that's basically an emergent property. So it's not put in by hand in any way. It emerges um, from this from in this case making a filament change so i'll just show it uh, real quickly so basically it cannot go back because geometrically it's constrained so even though it's uh, still kind of an equilibrium situation you create a barrier that's um, too high for it to go back and then the only pathway it can take is forward basically to bud off so even though energetically like free energy minimum might be going back but by by doing this dynamical change, you effectively you create a membrane neck that creates mechanical barrier, or if you wish in a free energy terms, it creates a large uh, free energy barrier for the virus to go back. And then by kind of modulating landscape dynamically, you drive the system uh, to one side. Mm -hmm. So it's it's completely emergent from the um, simulation ingredients. It's not put in by hand in any way. Right, Nor okay, did yeah. this me membrane cutting, or that's all emergent from uh, simulations. So we didn't do that by hand. Okay, sounds very good. Okay, so uh, I think we move on to the next uh, talk. Thank, Thank you again, Angela. Very nice Thank talk. Thank you all. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the next talk then. That's by uh, Nate Goering uh -huh. from the Crick Institute. Hopefully, he's here. Yeah. Uh, just a very yeah, good, very good. Um, just a very brief introduction. Uh, he got his PhD from the Harvard Medical School in 2006 and then moved on to the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden and then later became a uh, group leader at uh, Cancer Research UK and then moved on to the Crick. So he works on pattern formation, uh, um, self-assembly and uh, symmetry breaking and development. So I'm very excited okay. that he's here and I'm looking forward. Let's just see if I can get this thing to work. It didn't work yesterday. Eh. Um, yeah. So we can hear you, but we can't see the slides. Yeah, I'm trying to get the. So it says your share. I'm trying to share the presentation. I think uh, yesterday... did you sh did you share presentation or did you share your window? Uh, I sh I shared. <laughs> I clicked this. A little arrow and then I clicked on the presentation but it didn't work so well and so so when I tried it out yesterday when I just uh, did share screen and I picked a particular presentation from the menu at the bottom it picked the wrong one I, it's maybe <laughs> easier to pick the screen and then you go to the window you want okay, to let's and try this then this okay does anybody Perfect. see my screen now yes yes yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't get much feedback on this. All right. So now, okay, so now it should be full screen. Yes, yep, that's right. Yep. Okay. All right, we'll give this a go. All right, thanks, Robert. Um, fingers crossed. Please, somebody interrupt if um, the thing stalls or the movies don't play or whatever. So let's see how it goes. Um, so, um, in my lab, we're generally interested in understanding the physical principles of symmetry breaking and pattern formation um, in the context of cell polarity. And really what I mean by that are these, is thinking about these protein networks that um, set up asymmetric patterns in the cell and drive functional asymmetry. Um, and just to put this in context, if you think about any of the cells in your body, the vast majority of them are going to show some form of functional asymmetry. And that's whether it could be front back, it could be bottom top, or it could be, in the, particularly in the case of complex tissues and embryos, um, inside out. All right, and in all these cases, you're going to have some underlying um, cell polarity network that is going to try to define find that asymmetry and regulate numerous processes. And so at least from the biological perspective, the types of questions we're answering here are thinking about the types of intrinsic or extrinsic cues that feed into these networks, how these networks convert these cues into stable polarized or asymmetric patterns of molecular localization across the cell, and ultimately how these are then read out um, to give rise to functional outputs in cells. Um, and the system that 
we've chosen to study this is the uh, one cell embryo of the nematode C. elegans. I um, mean, it's really been a workhorse of um, uh, elucidating general principles in cell polarity for um, probably well over 30 years now. Um, and I'm not going to get bogged down in, in the molecular details today. Um, do interrupt or ask at the end if you want more detail. But essentially, for the purpose of today's talk, you can think about um, this polarity network as being comprised of two antagonistic sets of proteins. Um, we call them PAR proteins for partitioning defective. And they come in two flavors here, an APAR and a PPAR, a red and a blue. Um, and it's the antagonistic relationships between these proteins that allow them to segregate into defined domains along the plasma membrane that you can see here um, um, that define these sort of red and blue domains. And it's ultimately these membrane domains that are going to define, in this case, the anterior um, and posterior of the uh, of the em developing embryo. And this in these in turn are going to regulate downstream processes that involve the asymmetric segregation of fate so that when this cell divides, you get two different kinds of cells, one that will become a somatic cell and one that will train germline characteristics. And just to give you a sense of, of what this looks like, um, you, can, you can see this is initially a one cell embryo that hasn't polarized. The red proteins are on the membrane and the blue proteins are in the cytoplasm. And what you'll see is that the, the red proteins will initially segregate to one side that define the anterior. They'll be replaced on the other side by the blue proteins. And as these domains form, if we look at what's happening to fate markers, you can see that they start to be um, segregated asymmetrically into the anterior half and posterior half of the cell so that they're inherited differentially. And this is really what drives this, this fate difference. Um, and you know, this has really been a, a, a powerful system because of the genetics of the system to identify many of the molecules that are involved in this process. Um, and we think we have a pretty good collection. But I think what's really um, transforming the field and what's really been exciting for me is, is to really think of this. The cell has really become a, a playground for thinking about physical processes in cell biology. And here I'm just going to highlight, here's, here's three, for example, that are involved in polarization. So at least in our work, um, we've been focusing primarily on thinking about how these proteins segregate themselves on the plasma membrane, and we've been developing um, reaction diffusion frameworks to try to understand this process, to look at sort of what kinds of feedback are required for segregation, how this maps to molecular determinants, and how this regulates sensitivity of the system to, for example, responding to cues. Another area that's really um, this, this system has really been a model for is understanding cytoskeletal behaviors, and particularly of the, of the actin cortex. So this is a thin cytoskeletal layer that lives under the membrane uh, here. Polarization turns out to be a very mechanically driven process, and I'll come back to that in a few slides. Um, and here, just to sort of highlight this one area. One area that's um, really come out of this analysis of, of C. elegans is this um, development of active polar gel theories to understand cytoskeletal dynamics. And here, in the case of um, to understand how these theories can give rise to ideas about contractile flow in cytoskeletal networks um, um, in the cell, both during symmetry breaking in the case of this embryo and also during things like cell division. And finally, one thing which I think probably is very familiar to people here um, is notions of liquid-liquid phase separation. And really, this field got a, got a real kickstart um, upon the discovery that some of these, the segregation of some of these fate determinants here in orange um, are really driven by a liquid-liquid phase transition. Um, that's regulated in space and allows these proteins to condense on one side of the, these, these factors to condense on one side of the cell to drive symmetry breaking. So really there's, there's sort of two points here. Um, one, I think this, this sort of new approach to looking at cell biology, um, and so for me as a biologist, has really um, forced us to move beyond thinking just about molecules to really thinking about physical principles and design principles that allow these processes to occur. Um, Though we still and and really how this emerges from the ensemble behaviors of the the myriad amount number of proteins that are involved in this process, and second, I think even this slide alone tells you um, when we confront this, it's it's not like we're really thinking about if we th think about the cell biology as a whole, um, it involves interacting with lots of different people and lots of different physical ideas um, because you can see here there's 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 um, very diverse physical processes that are all required to be coordinated to understand the biology. So this is both a challenge and an excitement. I get to work with lots of people, but also it means um, sort of pushing ourselves into lots of new new ideas that generally as a biologist we're not um, um, familiar with, which is really why these, these networks like this and Imperial are so important. Um, and so 
today I just want to I just want to give you a flavor of of sort of two two little vignettes about how really approaching this this process of polarization from a more um, systems level perspective um, has has revealed new insights and and got us thinking about uh, some new problems um, in terms of cell biology. All right. And so one of these I think would be very familiar to those to many of you in the audience is, is thinking about um, questions of size and scaling. And particularly here we are interested in in how, for example, reaction diffusion networks um, are affected by system size. And so, for example, in the case of the embryo, um, thinking about how our our patterns forming system of our PARs, it's typically comprised of two domains characterized by reversed sort of um, distinct protein concentrations. Um, defined by these sort of plateaus you see in this plot, separated by a gradient or an interface. And so you can imagine in in the biological system, you can you can imagine that the, these this pattern could scale with cell size, in which case it would suggest that to really understand how the system works, we need to think about what kinds of cell sensing, cell size sensing mechanisms might be operating here, and how you would tune reaction networks um, as a function of size. And alternative, alternatively, it could be that the gradient doesn't scale in these kinds of systems. And in this case, you end up with a system that um, essentially will allow you to pattern within a defined range of cell sizes. And, and from our perspective um, of the C. elegans embryo, what was nice is that the biology gives you um, sort of a, a motivation to really tackle this question and, and, and a natural experiment to see, at least for these this PAR reaction network that we've been using to try to understand polarity, how it might respond to, to cell size and what the implications are for development, and so on the left here, you can you can you can see that the PAR network is operating in a series of cells. The first four cells here that are that are labeled in blue all will polarize using the same network. And so what we can do is go in and simply quantify the pattern of PAR protein localization in these cells, and and I just ask the question: Does it scale or not? And what kind of regime are we dealing with? And in fact, what I hope you can see here now on the right. Um, um, are the sort of plots of this polarity protein around the membrane. And you can see in all cases, it's the cells are polarized, but, it, but the, the pattern is quite different. So in the large cells, P0 and P1, um, you have these very clear plateaus that are separated by defined interface regions that are very, that take up a relatively small fraction of the overall cell length. But as the cells become smaller in P2 and P3, you see that the gradient takes up a much larger fraction of the cell. Right, and so this is clearly a regime where the gradient is not scaling in response to cell size. And consequently, you'd predict that as the cell becomes small enough, you would hit some sort of fundamental, fundamental, fundamental limit um, to the size of the cell that can polarize. And so again, th this is kind of interesting thought experiment. We can go back and say like, okay, well, you know, here's a here here's a regime where the diffusive, pro the reaction diffusion properties of the network define a range over which a cell can polarize. And then as cells move out of that range, for example, they get smaller in development, you might induce switches in the cell behavior just because these patterns can no longer, these pattern forming systems can no longer be accommodated, right? So we did a simple experiment, again, taking advantage of the richness of the C. elegans system in terms of mutants that are available to study. And we can look at this process. Um, oops, I'm gonna have to, we're frozen. I'm going to see if this restarts. Oops. Um, OK. Everybody see the movie, hopefully? Um, so in the middle here, I'm just showing two embryos, one larger than average and one smaller than average. Um, this polarity protein here is labeled in this sort of red scaling, um, and you can see this is this this is um, this is this third cell, this P3 cell, um, and what you can see is already the, the pattern of localization of this protein differs between this P3 cell and large and small embryos. In large embryos, it's very clearly polarized, and in small cells, um, it has a it looks unpolarized, so it looks rather uniform around the cell. And if you follow this um, through to division, what you'll see is that the large cell polarizes just fine, divides asymmetrically, and retains this fate determinant in one daughter cell, whereas in the small, the system, the cells effectively divide symmetrically and you get even inheritance. So effectively, a simple change in cell size because of the way it interacts with this reaction diffusion network seems to trigger a switch in cell behavior, which we think may be sort of a general um, feature of developmental systems, particularly 
Um, in early embryos where cells tend to divide without growing. And so these cells are constantly changing in size, which poses both sort of a challenge um, to systems like, like this that need to polarize across, that need to polarize the diversity of cells. But also in this case, you can actually use this um, decoupling between length scales of the reaction diffusion system and the cell length to trigger switches in behavior. Um, and now in just the last minutes, I just want to switch gears a bit and talk about a whole a sort of a different physical perspective that we've gone into. And this really focuses around how asymmetry is induced in the first place. And as I said, it's a mechanical process. Um, it's driven by what we call the actomycin cortex, which is a thin layer of actin and myosin lying under the membrane. And you can see that labeled here in the middle by um, labeling non-muscle myosin 2. And the way this works is that as uh, the, the cortex gets a cue from the centrosome of the embryo, it induces a contractile asymmetry in this, in this actomycin network, resulting in a flow of material from posterior to anterior. And it's this flow that's associated with the initial asymmetric accumulation of PAR proteins on one side of the cell, as you can see here on the right. And really what some of the questions is, is how is this flow of actomycin driving this transport of these membrane associated molecules? And we initially just took sort of a numbers approach to this and we said, okay, well, we have a molecule that can exchange between a freely diffusing cytoplasm and um, a membrane associated state. In a membrane associated, it will obviously undergo lateral diffusion in the plane of the membrane. But when it's attached to the membrane, it's also gonna move with a velocity that's given by flow. So here, again, it's a numbers game. Your, your ability to be transported is going to be defined by your Peclet number, which is going to reflect the contributions of flow versus diffusion in the system. And so, uh, so essentially, as you, as you can see in these simple models on the right, as you increase the diffusivity of the molecules, um, the effective diffusivity of the molecules in the membrane, it becomes harder and harder to drive asymmetry with a given amount of flow. Right? And if we plug this into models of, of, of polarity that we've developed for the for the C. elegans embryo to describe the PAR proteins. We've measured their parameters of, of diffusion and membrane binding and, and flow velocities. We can plug this together and we see that this largely works. So the flow velocities that we have are more than sufficient to drive asymmetric transport of, of PAR proteins given their diffusivities on, on the membrane. But really, this, is, this has been a bit controversial because the question is, you know, these molecules are associated with the membrane. They're not physically attached to the cortex in any way that we know. And so the question really is how motion in the cortex is coupling to the surrounding layers. And, and one way you can think about this would be that essentially these are, are, are viscously coupled layers of, of, of fluids, right? The membrane could be considered a fluid, the cortex can be considered a fluid, and the cytoplasm fluid, and that there would be viscous coupling between these layers so that things in these near the cortex, essentially things would all be moving together due to this, to this coupling. But you know, this isn't something that has really been um, fully fleshed out um, in, in cells. And so whether this numbers game makes sense and is really fair is something that's been a bit of an open question. And we started getting back into this by, by sort of looking more carefully at how molecules are segregated. And here we're looking at the surface of the embryo using turf. And what you, you notice right away is that these PAR proteins, as they're moved, they associate within these defined um, little clusters. And you can really see these clusters moving across the embryo um, as the cell polarizes. And what was striking in experimental work was that if we simply manipulated the ability of these molecules to cluster, as you can see here in the bottom of it, you don't see this clustering anymore, um, these proteins no longer were transported by the flow. Right? And so you had two, two molecules, both on the membrane, but behaving very differently in, in response to these flows. And you could you can wonder there could be two causes for this. One, it could be exactly like what we're thinking in terms of, of the Peclet number, but that clusters really are defining the, are restricting the mobility of these molecules in the cortex so that the, the, the flow is, the flow based transport is more efficient. So it's effectively, you can imagine there, the clusters slow diffusion. And so now flow with flow dominates and they're transported. Right? And when we get rid of clustering, they diffuse faster and then flow is much less effective. Alternatively, it could be that, that clusters themselves sense these flows better, but because of their size or some other feature that they really, they feel flows in a way that single monomers don't, irrespective of their diffusivity. And we thought we, we were in a position to tackle this really by applying some um, particle tracking types of techniques. And so the, the, the basic idea here is what we needed to do was in individual tracked molecules, uncouple the diffusive components to their motion and their advect and their and their flow or advective components of their motion. And you can do this by, and this is some work that, that we've developed um, in part with Robert. Um, we take a local, we can get a local, um, we can measure a local flow field to define the local um, flow vector. 
And then we can overlay this with tracks of single particles. So we can decompose motion of the particles um, parallel and orthogonal to the flow direction. And for a molecule undergoing simple Brownian uh, diffusion, what you'll get is essentially if you plot a displacements of molecules um, versus time, you'll get a Gaussian distribution of displacements all centered around uh, zero. And these are going to be the same orthogonal and parallel to flow. Right? But if there is a, a flow component, an advective component, you'll still get um, two Gaussians, but now the position of these Gaussians will be shifted, and the difference in this position um, of the um, Gauss of the displacements parallel to flow versus orthogonal will give you a measure of of this bias due to to advection. Um, so, so Nate, you're cutting now into your question answer time. So just to let okay, you know. Okay, sorry, just that's just one slide. And so what we did is we can look, as you can see very nicely, that the um, that in the clustered molecules. The, in, when you go parallel, when you look at displacements parallel to flow, um, they're moved efficiently. Um, but when you across a range of diffusivities, so regardless of sort of cluster size, which is going to define diffusion, they're they're affected nicely. But as soon as you flip it to the monomeric mutant, we see that all sensitivity to flows is, is erased, right? And so for advective molecules, we think kinetics is a good predictor of behavior, but Molecules of the member really are experiencing diverse transport regimes, which I think opens in, um, really some interesting questions in terms of thinking about this interface. Um, and so really some of the things questions we're asking now are what really defines the ability of molecules to tap into the flow. Okay, so that's it. Um, just to end, just to reiterate the richness of, of, I think, physical phenomena that drive cell biology and the richness of cell biological systems for sort of thinking about physical problems. And also um, just to thank those involved, um, work I talked about, mainly Rukshala, Lars, and Florent in the lab, and can't um, ignore all of the collaborators that have made this possible. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Um, while we wait for questions on the chat line, let me just kick this off. Um, so I, I find it always very interesting, you know, how to approach problems. So, um, you know, as you as you know, I mean, physics is very parsimonious. It's um, using Occam's razor. It's about simplicity. And on the other end, you have the biology and your biologists by training, uh, embracing all this complexity. So, so how do you pick now the right level of abstraction with your with your models, and how do you go about this problem? Yeah, I think this. I mean, I think this is always a tricky point, and I find this is sort of some places you often have to start when you start to discuss with collaborators. Um, and I'm not sure that there's there's one answer here. So, I mean, I think on the one side. The biology, if, you, if your hope is to completely capture all the biology, it almost becomes a hopeless endeavor because there's so much complexity and always um, sort of, I think, tweaks you can do to get the system to not behave with the model. On the other hand, you know, you don't want the model to be so simple that it doesn't provide insight into the biology. So I think the key is to keep relevant. Um, and I think that's often a trick, right? Models can be very good and yet wrong. And so the key is to make, make sure that you're always validating things and bring it back. And that's, I feel like that's a sort of living in between has sort of helped try and keep that guided. Um, yeah, yeah. Are there any questions um, also from the speakers? So, so, so one person has their hand up, Robert, um, Ru Ruben Perez. Okay, Ruben. Hi, Nate. Hi, Ruben. <laughs> uh, so, so my question is like at the beginning you were talking about these uh, gene regulatory networks and how mm -hmm. like uh, they they allow for this visibility. Yes. But then you move away from it to more mechanical uh, mechanisms. So my question is like how relevant are these different components? So, so I guess like in terms of timing, it's mm -hmm. important to control all the biochemical reactions. The timing is going to be controlled completely by advection. Um, so the, I, I'm just trying to understand the question. So is the so no, my question is is like how you really disentangle the scales of chemical and mechanical in order yeah. for as a question of time, or are so entangled that actually you have always to solve the whole problem? So so I think there's two there's two answers here. So um, one is you can actually use the genetics of the system to play around with this. So for example, you can you can actually take away the actin cortex and now leave behind just the par polarity network, right? And you can ask, how does that system behave? And that allows you to make a lot of measurements. And then you can layer in the uh, the advection back, and right? And so you can you can play some tricks like this. And the other thing is obviously to get gut checks on the types of um, 
reaction parameters. So for example, using things like single particle tracking or, or, or measurements of tension and mechanics to really bound your system, right? To say, you know, are these things operating on similar or different timescales? In the terms of polarity, um, the reaction network is a bit slow. Right. So, in fact, I think one thing that's evolved in the embryo that may not be the case in some other systems is that it's very strongly driven by mechanics. And that mechanics means that you can polarize in about five minutes, whereas allowing polarity to proceed just through reaction diffusion alone probably takes on the order more of 30 minutes to an hour. Right. And so you could see that in evolution, you might tune between those different things. Right. In the embryo, you really flow driven because you need to develop fast. These divisions happen every 20 minutes. In another cell type, say the Drosophila embryo, polarity emerges over hours, right? And you have plenty of time for these, these more reaction dependent networks to work. And so I think biology is rich that way, that you know you can take sort of a core mechanism and then shift it into different regimes that might allow different types of things to dominate. Okay. Thanks. Um, sounds good. Thank you very much, Nate. Okay, let's move then on to the next talk. And the next talk is mm. by Chu Fan Li. So he got his PhD in physics from the University of Oxford in 2005. He was then a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Physics of Complex Systems. That's also in Dresden and uh, sort of very close to where Nate was. And then he be became group leader in bioengineering at um, Imperial College. And he is very much interested in questions, of, very similar questions in terms of phase transitions and symmetry breaking. Uh, so, um, Chufan, it's over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. So, my status is set to do not disturb. So, maybe, okay. Can you let me share? Um, I don't know who's sharing right now. Is, is, is it still Nate who's sharing? Now you're here. Okay, so, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we tested it yesterday. It's still always take a, a bit of time. Okay, so I think we are there. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm Chu Fan Li, based in the Department of Bioengineering. So today I'm going to talk to you about novel physics arising from phase transitions in biology. Let me just swap it to laser pointer. Right. So. In my group, we strive to uh, explore new physics um, to explain and study biological systems. So in particular, we're interested in these three biological systems that exhibit phase transition like behavior across many different length scales. And thanks to the previous speakers, Angela and Nate, you've seen some of the examples already. So at the nano scale, we are looking at um, a bunch of biopolymers, they are called aminoid fibrils. They are basically uh, protein polymers that are implicated in a lot of human diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, type 2 diabetes. And the transition from the soluble form of the protein, which tend to be endogenous in our body and harmless, to the misfolded polymeric form called the uh, aminoid fibrils is a phase transition-like behavior. Uh, a phase transition like phenomenon. Now, this is, is, is phase transition in quotation because it's, it's actually not a thermodynamic phase transition because there's no discontinuities in the, uh, in the free energy. But it certainly has all the salient features of a phase transition, such as a critical concentration beyond which the soluble uh, protein will just spontaneously self-aggregate into these polymeric forms. So the understanding of how they transition into this fibular form is, of course, of prime importance to us as human beings because of this uh, many pathologies. Now, if we moving move up in length scale to the micron scale now, so this is a C. elegans embryo that Nate has uh, talked a lot about. This is at the one cell stage right after fertilization. Now, in particular, I would like you to focus on the green blobs. They're called P granules. We now know that they form via liquid-liquid phase separation, which is pretty much like oil droplet formation in aqueous solution. So and at the beginning of the movie, so it's looping, but at the beginning of the movie, you can see that they're everywhere. 
And then at the late stage, like now, right before uh, division, now stated this is the beginning, and then later on they all localize to one side, and this localization and formation is uh, important for the development of the organisms. And the fact that we now know phase separation is actually uh, used a lot in um, in cells to organize this interior. This is just one particular example. There are many organelles that are formed via phase, separa separa uh, phase separation. So this realization is only a decade old and I think it has revolutionized how we understand cell biology. And uh, many textbooks would have to be re rewritten uh, in in uh, in due course, I believe. So, of course, obviously, phase phase separation is a phase transition behavior. The bio biomolecular biomolecular condensates are phase separated drops here in this case. Now, moving up still in length scale, this is a so-called wound healing assay. Now we are talking about millimeter uh, because we are looking at bunch of cells, each about 30 microns, and it's called a wound healing assay because in this experiment, the experimentalist grow and confluent layer of cells and then just scratch out the middle. And as you can see, the cells will just move in to fill up the void, very much like what would happen if you cut your skin. So this is what we call now in the physics community um, active matter. So Nate also introduced this kind of uh, material before in the context of uh, cortex, the cell cortex. This, uh, so we call it active because, well, in here, every constituent um, uh, matter can proliferate, can move. So it's very different from the thermal material that we are familiar with. So the, in this, and another novelty of this system is that the active matter can actually move coherently as a whole. And as a result, there's a, a persistent current, which is obviously not possible in a thermal system. And the persistent current is coming from the fact that we are continuously putting nutrients into the buffer or ATP into the solution so that uh, the, the cells can actually con uh, convert those chemical energies into mechanical energies. So because of the fact that they can move coherently, there's a something called a uh, collective motion phase, which is basically a persistent parent in a particular direction. Every cell is moving in the same direction on average. Now, today I'm going to focus exclusively, ah, frozen. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm just, so I stop sharing and then do it again. <laughs> okay, so okay, yeah. so today I'm going to focus exclusively on the uh, on the last topic, active matter. So to refine the title now, I uh, which I recall is novel physics arising from phase transitions in biology. Um, so to to make it more focused, um, sorry, frozen again. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so let's try again. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so so by phase transition, what I'm going to fo specifically focus on are the phases that we are going to see. And for the word biology, I'm going to focus exclusively on one important attribute of biology, and that is active motility. Right. So the, the more succinct and focused title from now on is going to be novel phases in active systems. And um, so to, let's step back and ask. Sorry, people, um, it's frozen again. So what maybe I do this and then keep going okay now what are phase let's step back and ask the fundamental question what are phases or state of matter now that the number one important property of distinct phases is the fact that the distinct phases are always separated by phase transitions which means a thermodynamic continuities these continuities right so let's pick a single component system as an example we're talking about a single a, a system of a uh, molecules that interact for example via just linear jones potentials and a typical phase diagram would look something like this we will have a solid phase liquid phase gas phase depending on the temperature and pressure 
Now, in this case, solid liquid and solid gas transitions are always separated by phase transitions, the red, the red lines. Hence, solid and liquid or solid and gas are distinct phases. And however, huh, I don't know uh, what's the best way to move forward because it keeps on um, freezing on the... So are you, um, Chufan, are you using the, the slideshow or, or how do you do it? Slideshow, right? I, 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 uh, I can go on the slideshow. I, I try both, but I'm just, I, now, if so I just... Slideshow, but just show the slides without going in the mode, the slideshow mode. Without going into the slides. So yeah, I tried that. Now it's working again. <laughs> yeah. So, so however, for the liquid and gas, actually you can go from the liquid phase to the gas phase without going through a phase transition as demonstrated by this green arrows here. You increase pressure, you increase temperature, lower pressure, lower temperature. So liquid gas are actually not distinct phases, right? They are the, they are the same phase. Now we can, another uh, property of uh, distinct phases that, co that uh, corresponds to distinct phases is the fact that uh, distinct phases can be characterized by distinct symmetries and conservation laws. So each system can have their own symmetries and conservation laws and distinct phases will have distinct symmetries and conservation laws. Now let, let's take the gas liquid solid phase diagram as an example again a one component system now, the liquid and solid or gas and solid do have distinct symmetries because in liquid and gas, you've got translational symmetry, but in solid, it's broken. You've got a crystalline structure. So they are distinct phases. So that's good, uh, consistent with the previous uh, realization. And again, liquid and gas are of the same phase because they, they share the same symmetry. There's no distinct symmetries that let you distinguish between liquid and gas. So hence, perfectly consistent with the previous property. So now let's ask the question, when is a new phase a new phase, right? When you uh, study a new system, let's say a biological system, and you can identify novel symmetries or novel conservation laws that no one has uh, incorporated or uh, uh, investigated before. Uh, does it mean that you have a new phase? Well, unfortunately, it's not as simple as that because the complication here is that Distinct system, although distinct phases would have distinct symmetries, the reverse is not true. You can have systems with distinct symmetry, but they end up on this being in the same phase. So how do we know that a, a phase, a new a, a system, a non-equilibrium system in, bio, uh, in biology, is a new phase in physics? So one solution to, to tackle this problem is to use renormalization group methods to identify novel phases. Now, RG, is, uh, RG methods are familiar to all physicists, but what it is is basically a calculational tool that connects your microscopic or mesoscopic model to the large distance uh, macroscopic uh, uh, behavior. So now RG methods were invented by Kenneth Wilson and others. It's, it was a Nobel Prize winning uh, invention in the 60s and 70s. And it can be, as I said, used to elucidate large distance behavior of the starting model equations. So pictorially, what people do would be to say, OK, I, I start with a, the symmetries and conservation laws, and then I write down the, the set of most generic equation of motion that's constrained by the conservation law. So here I say equation of motion because we are interested in non-equilibrium systems, but if you are talking about a thermal system, you would say, you give me the symmetries and conservation laws, I write down the free energy or Hamiltonian to describe the system. So starting with that, then you, you can just crank the handle of the RG formalism. It is a mechanical calculation, pretty mechanical, but usually the calculation is quite involved. But you, if it can be done, then you can you do it. And the output of that is typically a so-called RG flow diagram. Here is a cartoon version based on a real system, but it's a sort of representative version of the flow diagram where the two axes here are the model parameters of your original equation of motion. So in, in your equation of motion, you would have many parameters, so usually infinite dimensional. So the flow diagram here is sort of like a reduction, dimensional reduction representation of the flow diagram, right? So the arrows here is suggesting how these parameters would change as you 
coarse grain the system, or as you go from the microscopic or mesoscopic scale to the larger microscopic scale, and eventually you may end up with a fixed point, i.e. if you coarse grain it enough, maybe the parameters no longer change. And if that happens, then we call it uh, a fixed point or a universality class, and this fixed point can tell us whether which phase the system is in. Right, so that's that's what that's why I said as you can let us identify novel phases. So let's look at active fluids as a particular example. Just looking at how you would start as a starting point, right? So active fluids is like the tissue that I showed. The conservation law is mass conservation, so it's not the wound healing assay that we looked at. But typically, you you say, well, if if the cells do not proliferate and do not die, then we would have mass conservation. And then the symmetries here are very canonical, translational, rotational, temporal, chiral. These are the really typical symmetries that no one's going to debate with. As an example, by saying temporal symmetry, I just mean that if you do the experiments on Sunday, it has to be, if you were to do it on Monday, the, the, the outcomes have to be the same. So i.e. the dynamics of the system cannot depend on which day you do the experiments in. And that, that's how, how, how uh, canonical these uh, symmetries are. And then from that, you can write down the most generic equation of motion that describes active fluids, where the momentum field will be G and the density field is rho. So this is kind of like a generalized Navier-Stokes equation, and now we call Turner and Chu equation. So this is the starting point of, and then you do RG on this equation and try to come up with new phases. So the question is, so are there new phases in active systems that people were not aware of? And the answer is yes, we, we've discovered two new phases so far. So one of them is the collective motion phase of an infinitely compressible active fluid. So remember the previous generalized Navier-Stokes Navier equation, now you make it infinitely compressible, which means that you just ignore the density field because the momentum field does not care where, how compressed things are. And in that scenario, in that simplified scenario, then one can do the RG and found the fixed point, a novel fixed point. So this collective motion phase is a new phase in spatial dimension higher than two. Now we don't know what happened when it is two. Now, and there's an, an, a second new phase in non-equilibrium physics is that um, the collective motion phase of the opposite limit of the first phase, which is now we take the incompressible limit, which means that again, we ignore the density field, but we say the divergence of the momentum field has to be zero. That's the typical sort of incompressibility condition. And again, in dimension higher than two, this is a new phase. So, but the, however, in two, exactly two dimension, for the incompressible version, we also know we also know what happens. It that is not a new phase; it actually belongs to an existing, well-known uh, phase called the uh, Cartier-Parisi sand universality class. So this is a, a interesting example of when you can talk about two systems with completely different microscopic physics, different symmetries, and they end up with this uh, being in the same universality class, being in the same phase. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say on the sort of the technical details, but let me just use this slide to outline the vision of, of, of my research agenda, right? So it, when people talk about our physics, the typical uh, connotation would be using to use physics to, uh, to understand uh, biology quantitatively. But I guess what's less emphasized is the fact that biological systems are fertile grounds for discovering new physics. And so I think these loops is, uh, is actually a loop and uh, going through the loop over and over again can inspire new physics and new biology simultaneously. So I, so this is a, the, my team at Imperial, uh, and uh, I would like to acknowledge the funding, and also there's a, a, a fully funded PhD position available at the moment. You can find the adverts on fundaphd.com if you are interested. And the work that I described uh, were done in collaboration with Noemin Chan, and John Tona. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Chufan. And thank you for keeping more or less the time, even with the interruptions, it's fantastic. Um, uh, let me just kick this off very briefly and before we go to some other questions. So, um, so in the beginning, you talked about, um, uh, you know, the, the different phases like liquid, liquid phase transitions and so on. So one could say, you know, one could approach a problem like said from a, 
from a thermodynamic perspective, looking at macroscopic variables, uh, different phases, for instance, if you like. And of course, then there would be, um, uh, you know, say microscopic ways, a statistic mechanics approach, more like, I guess, uh, bottom up. So, uh, so how, wh what do you think is a good philosophy to start in a, in a, a modeling from top down or more say bottom up or, or how yes. do you see it? Yeah, it's a great, great question, right? So, so you can start with you, if you know the microscopic dynamics very well. If you know the sort of micro microscopic interactions, then you can start with the. But I would say you can start with the, the the microscopic set of equations, and then you do coarse graining. And ultimately, when we talk about phases, maybe for historical reason, it has to be in the thermodynamic limit because that's the only place where you can have a singularities of any sort, right? So if we talk about thermal system, the partition function is just perfectly smooth until you sum over infin infinitely many components. So, so it just it is inevitable that when we want to talk about phases, we have to go to the thermodynamic limit. And but that, but the RG method, for instance, and there are other methods of coarse graining, does allow you to connect your microscopic model to the hydrodynamic by hydrodynamic, I mean large distance, right? So up to the hydrodynamic limit. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um so there was a question by Tom Aldrich. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Tom. Hey Chifan, can you hear me? Uh, Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, Thank you. So uh, obviously in in the solid liquid transition, there's this broken um, translational symmetry where yeah. it goes from being continuous to being discrete. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering whether um, I mean, it sounds like your your fl the two the flow phase transitions you were talking about are modeling the system as continuous, just looking at your equations. Yeah. yeah. Is there also does the discreteness of cells ever come into any of these phase transitions? Is there anything interesting yeah. involved in that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So in 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 the in the formulation I, I talked about that we didn't take that into account, that that's valid if the cells can always rearrange themselves. But one very exciting development in cell biology is the, the sort of the glassy behavior of cell right as you may may know already so that is very much i would say to do with the discretized nature of the cells but that that's to capture for that then one would need to set this equation equation up differently so it's oh, yeah. much, much like glassy physics you will never get glassy physics from navier stokes equation but that's not the point so right right yeah, yeah. okay so, but you say there is people there is interest in in yeah. in, in looking for phase transitions at that sort of yeah, absolutely. Gla glassy, glass is very much not understood uh, even in physics, e even in thermal system, right? I think it's fair yeah. to say that. So if you add activity to it, it's even less understood. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Um. So, so Chufan, just to um, maybe have another one here actually. Yeah. So, um. You know how do how do how do we treat um, as modelers? I mean, how do we treat this physics biology interface? So I it's, I find it always very interesting. You know, depending where people come from, their eyes on one side or the other one. Yeah. So you know, on one side, on the physics side, you can be very rigorous, but it's very yeah. simplistic. You could be on the biology side, maybe it's more the systems biology side, and and then you deal with all this molecular complexity. So, but I find rarely the people are sort of quite quite closely yeah. at this border. And yeah, yes. how how do how do you how do you approach this problem? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, right? So this talk I gave is purely physics, right? You can say that's was where's the biology? That's the motivation of the biology, and then the biology disappears. So you obviously I I also publish in biology journals, right? So yeah, it, it, and it will be a very different kind. If I were to give a biology talk, it would be a very different kind of talk. But so so I think it's very rare where you can find examples that you have to develop new physics. In order to de to describe a existing biological problems, and liquid liquid phase transition uh, in in cell biology is one of those examples which I didn't talk about today. But but there you do need new physics because we know phase separation very well in the thermal setting, but we don't know non equilibrium phase separation very well. And there's a lot of new physics that has to be done. And so so I think that that that's one one really uh, great example where you have to be right at the interface you have to talk, talk to the biologist to, to know what is needed and then do the new physics and then go back to the bi biologist on that yeah 
Very good. Um, are, are there any more questions? I moved to different locations because the network connection seems to be slow. <laughs> I don't know if it's better here. Um, okay, I don't I don't see any other questions right now. So I think we take a, um, a five minute break and then we convene and I think Chu Fan, you're gonna moderate the next session. So yeah. take let's take a short break. So we Thank come back much. at uh, 20 past, is it? Is it uh, 20 past? It's correct, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Same. See you guys. Bye. <laughs> So maybe we can start since it's 20 past now. So Chris, are you here? All right, fantastic. So <clears throat> well, welcome again to the second session of the Physics of Life Symposium. Chris, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Oh, fantastic, sorry. Yeah, so, so our uh, first speaker of the session is um, Dr. Chris Dunsby from the Department of Physics and also the Department of Medicine, I think. And um, so Chris did his uh, master's at the University of Bristol and then his PhD at Imperial College. He's currently a reader in biomedical optics. So over to you, Chris. Great, thanks very much for the introduction. So can everyone hear me okay and see my slides? I yeah. can hear you and see your slides. Great. So. As uh, Choi Fan said, I'm in the Department of Physics and my area of expertise is in um, microscopy um, technology development. So in the talks that we've seen so far, um, we've seen uh, beautiful images of cells and uh, biological samples um, uh, moving around and um, those images are then quantified to provide uh, information to put into models of um, or physical models of uh, live systems. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the microscopy that we're developing in our labs that can help um, add uh, information and input into the development of such models. So the technique that we um, build our work around is that of fluorescence microscopy. Uh, fluorescence microscopy is very powerful. It's a a background free way of imaging um, specific biomolecules within cells. So this image here shows uh, cells labeled with three different fluorescent labels that are reporting here, nuclei, actin and mitochondria. And of course, there's also uh, genetic fluorescent um, proteins that we provide very highly specific labeling in live samples. Um, and there's a huge range of fluorescence microscopy techniques, wide field microscopy, confocal, multiphoton, and lots of different acronyms for different types of microscopies that have, people have developed. And overall, um, the, the frontiers of developing fluorescence imaging can be divided into sort of three different directions. So people looking at trying to improve the spatial resolution of such systems, trying to increase the speed or throughput of such systems, and also providing gentle imaging, so light, low light dose imaging and uh, imaging at depth. And I'm going to try and focus on the higher speed and higher throughput aspects of uh, developing microscopy techniques. And of course, the developments in instruments also go hand in hand with um, groups developing um, improved fluorescent probes and improved uh, image analysis approaches. So the technique that I'm going to talk about today is that of light sheet fluorescence microscopy. Um, this is, technique was um, originally uh, originated a long time ago at the turn of the century when people were studying colloids and was reinvigorated um, in around uh, the mid 2000s uh, when people were using it to study embryo development. And in this type of technique, you take a thin uh, sheet of laser illumination to illuminate a single plane in your specimen and then you place a lens at 90 degrees to the uh, light sheet in to detect the fluorescent signal that's excited. 
So light sheet microscopy uh, has a number of advantages. So one of them is that it gives a very low light dose to the sample because you only excite the plane in the specimen that you're imaging. So you get low photo bleaching and phototoxicity. You only excite the plane in the sample that you want to image. So there's no out of um, focus background to reject. You don't need a confocal pinhole that you would do in confocal microscopy. And the optically sectioned images that you acquire can be acquired directly. You don't need any moving parts uh, or any image processing. So you can acquire optically sectioned images directly at the frame rate of the camera that you're using. Uh, however, this geometry uh, that's conventionally used requires two lenses, one to provide the illumination sheet and one for the detection, to be put um, at 90 degrees to one another relatively near to the sample. And this restricts the range of sample mounting techniques that you can use, and it makes it harder to use uh, microscope slides and, and multi-well plates, which are sort of, um, conventionally used on regular uh, inverted and upright microscopes. So we wanted to develop uh, light sheet microscopy techniques that could be used on a wider range of different sample um, preparation methods. So just to uh, reiterate the conventional ge geometry, this is the type of geometry that you might have in a conventional dual objective light sheet microscope. You put your cell or whatever here at the, um, where the focus is of these two objectives intersect. And in order to acquire a, a 3D volume, normally you'd scan the sample through the static light sheet and the static detection plane of the collection lens. And so that's relatively slow. In our approach, we try and use a single lens um, to provide both the light sheet illumination and the detection. And this is a method that we call a bleed plane microscopy. So in this approach, we use optics to produce a tilted illumination sheet and then some remote refocusing optics to rapidly scan both the illumination and detection planes through the sample remotely. And so we can do that very quickly. Um, so how we achieve that, it's relatively easy to achieve tilted illumination. We can take a laser beam, focus it to a line and put that line on the edge of the back aperture of the objective so that it gives us tilted illumination. But then we have the issue of how we can image the tilted plane that we've illuminated. So you might just ask the question, well, let's just tilt the camera at the output of the microscope. But unfortunately, that doesn't work because of the um, spherical aberration and the highly um, stretched image that you get at the output of a normal microscope. So the approach that we came up with was to build on the work of Tony Wilson's lab where they had developed a remote refocusing technique. And the approach, first of all, sounds a little crazy, um, but you take a second microscope that undoes the magnification of the first microscope. So if you get the overall magnification correct, such that you've got equal lateral and axial magnifications, then if you've got a round um, object or a round sample, um, with equal lateral and axial magnifications, you end up with a round image. And that means that you can then place a third imaging system at an angle that lets you image the tilted plane that you've illuminated. So this is the system that we use in our labs. If you can consider this to the right of my cursor being a conventional light sheet microscope with orthogonal illumination and detection arms. And then we have this image relay that images the light sheet into the sample and the fluorescence from the sample back to the um, detection lens and then to the camera. And so the nice thing about this geometry is if we just move this lens backwards and forwards axially, it has the effect of scanning the light sheet and the detection plane through the sample axially. So if we scan that objective at 25 hertz, we can do video rate volumetric imaging. So this is the system in the lab. You can see it's built around a conventional um, inverted microscope frame. This is Vincent, one of the PhD students that has worked on the project. And an example of using this system, here we have a single isolated uh, cardiomyocyte, a heart cell loaded with fluorophore reporting intracellular calcium and cell mask orange reports to the membrane. And so we run this um, to acquire uh, volumes at 25 volumes per second. And we've got three maximum intensity projections of the same cell. So this is looking top down, uh, edge on and end on. And if I uh, play the movie, we can see this cell being electrically paced. Uh, so this is playing back at lower than, slower than real time. And in a minute, you can see a, a spontaneous calcium release that comes from somewhere over here in the cell. And so you can see that, that wave spreading down the cell and causing it to contract in a 
wave rather than a regular um, uniform fashion. So working with the National Heart and Lung Institute, we've been looking at uh, the effects of heart failure on cardiomyocytes. So within heart cells, there's this network of T tubules that lets fluid outside the cell um, rapidly penetrate inside the cell. And in heart failure, it's known that this T tubule structure is degraded. So this is some work from Heinzel et al showing the um, degradation of T tubule structure that's seen in heart failure. And we're working with the NHLI, we wanted to try and understand how this um, degradation in the T-tubal structure um, affected um, calcium waves within cells. And it's known that calcium waves are more frequent um, in failing in heart failure. And also they're thought to be one of the origins of arrhythm of arrhythmia in, in heart failure. So we wanted to study the calcium dynamics in the um, at high speed in 3D, but in the context of this um, T-tubal structure. So if we look at the same movie that we, I showed you before, but now Effectively, this, that volume has been salami sliced. So these are lateral XY planes from the cover slip up through the cell. And then if I play the movie, we can see um, where the wave originates from. So we can see where the wave originates from both in XY uh, and in um, Z, because we know which plane it's in. And so we can then look at the um, T-tubule structure in the cell, how, how much of it there is or how strongly that, that staining of the, the red striations there is at the point of the wave origin. And then we can look at um, where the wave, um, how the um, T-tubule staining or the T-tubule structure compares for points where we get waves uh, originating from relative to the median from that cell. So we can see that for this cell, the, the wave points of wave origin come from points where the T-tubule structure is relatively well preserved compared to the median for that cell. And so then we can do that for lots of cells. And what we've observed in the small number of cells that we've seen so far is that actually these waves seem to originate from regions of preserved T-tubule structure rather than regions of degraded T-tubule structure. And this information can be um, fed into models and theories for um, what's causing the increased um, uh, likelihood of waves within cardiomyocytes. You can also use this high speed imaging to look at um, dynamics in um, a zebrafish embryos. So this is a zebrafish um, heart of two, in, a, in a live embryo at two days post fertilization. And we can look at a single plane in the cell at uh, 200 frames a second. So this is looking at the, the heart beating and we can do video rate or near video rate volumetric imaging of the heart. Um, we, we've also used um, our system to provide a high speed uh, imaging capability of our system to, um, so I'm just looking at the time quickly, um, to be able to image 3D specimens in arrays. So by doing stage scanning, we can apply high speed imaging to look at lots of samples in arrays. And we've been doing this with the Institute of Cancer Research with Chris Bakel's lab, where they're interested in um, the changes in cell shape um, um, associated with cancer. Oh, I'm just going to skip this. So here we're looking at a, uh, an array of different conditions applied to these, this breast cancer cell line. Um, using the speed of the system, we're able to look at 30 different conditions every eight minutes over 15 hours. Um, and this is the sort of data set that we get. So again, we've got three um, orthogonal maximum intensity projections. This is looking top down, edge on and end on. And if I just drag through the movie, we can watch the cells migrating around in this collagen gel. Not sure how quickly this is playing across the internet, but hopefully you can see that we've captured the cell shape changes and motion over that time lapse. And this is happening, this is just one of the fields of view of the 30 that we're imaging. And then for a, each given cell, we can pick, um, computer just being slow, we can pick each cell out and look at the 3D motion. So these are orthogonal cuts through a single cell. Um, we've identified the shape of this cell, and then we can measure various shape parameters. So looking at the sphericity of the cell, we can track that over time and see the time profile as this cell uh, rounds up and then puts out protrusions again. And so we're doing this over lots of cells, over lots of conditions in parallel. Um, and so this is just showing that um, the drug treatments that we applied on this plate um, have been changing the sphericity um, on average, and also can, we can look at um, the changes in these shape parameters over time. 
We're also working uh, with the Francis Crick instrument using this type of approach. This is with Axel Behrens and Guillaume Salbru at the Crick. Um, the uh, Axel's lab is, um, works with um, mouse breast cancer organoids, um, various different types of um, organoid. And we're using the system to look at, uh, aiming to use the system to look at organoids under different conditions uh, over time. So these are, um, again, three wave maximum intensity projections over eight wells imaged over um, a number of hours. I think this is 50 hours um, approximately. And you can see, for example, this organoid here um, is doing something radically different from all of the other organoids. This one's growing um, very quickly. And the aim is, is that we can take each of the organoids. This is just one of the organoids now shown cut out from that big data set. So this is just one organoid of the, um, the tens of organoids that we're imaging over eight different conditions. And um, the aim is now to be able to follow each cell individually and to track its position so we can understand and develop um, better models of the, um, the driving the fate of each of the cells within each of the organoids. So Guillaume's lab, um, is working on uh, machine learning for cell segmentation uh, to track cells during growth. And then we're going to look at cell fate maps, um, events that um, govern division and, and cell death events so that we can uh, generate probability distributions for the various underlying um, uh, physical um, parameters that are going into models of, of these processes. So to finish there, I want to thank the, the people in the Department of Physics that have done the microscopy and the people at the National Heart, Inst Lung, National Heart and Lung Institute, Francis Crick Institute and Institute of Cancer Research that we're working with. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, great. Thank you very much. Perfectly on time. Thank you very much. So um, are there any questions? Maybe I can kick off um, with a brief question. So, so when you look at the calcium waves, uh, mm -hmm. what's the time scale that you you can do it in? It slow down, right? obviously, but um, so it, it depends on how fast a ca how much but money you have, um, <laughs> and how fast the camera you can buy, and uh, also how much light your cells will tolerate. Um, right. So the camera that we were using there was running at about 800 frames a second. And we've actually got a newer system in our lab that'll do about three times that, so running just under 2,000 frames a second. So then you can get 50 planes um, at video rate, so it's 50 planes at 25 volumes a second. And you need to think about how you distribute and spread those planes, um, depending mm -hmm. on what sort of spatial information you want. Right, okay, well, that, that's really amazing. Right, any other questions? I mean, I mean, I, I would if I have one. Yeah, um, Chris, yeah, thank you very much for this exciting talk. Um, so you talked about this lattice slide sheet and, and so on and said it can do really nice stuff in 3D. Um, and you, of course, you had a lot of exciting examples. I mean, there's um, there's no question about it. But what what can you say, let's say about, let's say we would do a meeting like said in, in five years. I mean, what is a what is a big question you think we can answer with this kind of technology and and yeah, where could we end up with in a few years, if, if you can say more about it? So I think for me, the uh, opportunity to be able to look at live cells, both in 3D and across a range of different conditions is, so I guess there's two things. There's being able to study things in high speed in 3D, which hasn't been possible with other types of um, microscopy before. So this type of high speed 3D imaging in uh, light sheet microscopy enables um, high speed events to be studied dynamically for the first time in 3D. Um, but it also lets you look at cells doing things in 3D um, gels or in organoids um, across arrays of specimens in an automated way across lots of conditions. So at the minute, I think we, we have a big um, data deluge problem to deal with, um, which, which we're working to develop sort of uh, compression and image analysis approaches to overcome that. But I think it's, it's really going to move into um, uh, improving the quantitation and the speed of quantitation. Um, and we're working with lots of different people with different questions, but I think it's the ability to look at different conditions in, in 3D environments is the uh, key um, enabling uh, feature of this type of microscopy. Thank you. All right. Okay. Any other questions um, from the audience? 
OK, if not, maybe we can move on to the next talk by Rosabam um, Garcia Milan. Ah, wow. Fantastic. OK, so a brief introduction. So Rosabam did her BSc in Barcelona and then an MSc uh, in Oxford. And now she's a PhD student with uh, Gunnar Prusner in the Department of Mathematics. OK, thank you. Just I just finished my PhD, so. Oh, all right. OK. <laughs> so Dr. Garcia Miller. <laughs> OK, I'm going to share my presentation. Hi, sorry. Can you see this? OK. Yes. Um, so I wanted to talk about this uh, this, this project that has to do with the organization of DNA inside the cell nucleus. And this is a project that is a collaboration between our group, the Non-Equilibrium Systems Group um, in the Math Department, and um, this, uh, the Mark and Schlager Lab in, um, in the Hammersmith Hospital. Um, so this, is, this project is about the um, properties of genome organization inside the DNA, uh, sorry, inside the cell nucleus. And just a quick num some quick numbers that I think are interesting. Um, the human DNA, if we were able to put it all in a string, um, um, sorry, I'm gonna have some water. If we were able to put all, all the human DNA on a string, this string would be about two meters long. It, it would be um, two nanometers of uh, diameter. So this is a very long object and it is fitted inside the cell nucleus. And this cell nucleus is about um, six micrometers. So that's an incredibly long object that is fitted inside very small volume. And obviously uh, this, this Two um, quantities are not. It's not fair to compare because it's a dimension. Oh, so it's a length. Com no, sorry, it's a length compared with a volume. So that's really not fair. But it gives an idea of how um, this is being packed and what is the degree of um, packing inside the nucleus. So. Um, in the human genome, there are about 20,000 genes. And just as a fun um, number, that there are many more bacteria in our, in our body than there are our own cells. So, um, well, one big question in the field is to understand how DNA is organized inside the cell nucleus. And of course, for the biologist, um, this is, the, the big question is, how does this organization affect the biological um, functions of the cell? So in this picture here, um, we can see the cell nucleus, but this is just a representation. This um, polymer-like object represents the different chromosomes. And this is um, represented in this way because it has been observed that um, chromosomes tend to segregate from each other. And so there are very little contacts between different chromosomes. And um, here I'm showing here I'm showing a picture where um, the cell nucleus. Uh, well, this is a microscopic picture of the cell nucleus. And so in this image, you can see that there are different regions according to their density of the chromatin. So um, there are regions where the chromatin is very dense and others where the chromatin is very not so dense. And that also, well, and then there's also a certain correlation with the type of molecules that you can find in the chromatin or bound to the chromatin. Um, and some of those, um, some of those um, proteins are, um, associated with activating genes and others are associated with repressing genes. So this is just a, a picture of how, well, 
DNA is wrapped around objects like this, which are the nucleotides. And here is where the histone markers get bound. Um, okay. Um, so, and this here, I just wanted to show that these are uh, base pairs, and this is something that's going to uh, come out later. So um, the big question is, okay, if the DNA is on a string, then there are going to be points that are distant on that st string, but then when they are inside the cell nucleus, those two points that are distant come in close con contact. And so uh, the question is how, um, how those points are, how, how the interactions between different points are happening. And so there's this uh, experiment called in situ high C, where um, it is possible to find the um, different points that are being in, in cl close contact. Sorry. Um, so, for example, if we um, here, I'm just drawing, um, let's say here, these are two bits of, of the DNA string. And here I'm going to label this as A, and this one as B, and this one as C, and this one as D. So here, after this process, we can see that, well, and we are able to sequence those ends, A, B, C, and D, then we are going to be able to uh, make an, something similar to an adjacency matrix and say, okay, A and B, um, or A and C are found in contact many times together. And so this is a way to measuring uh, the frequency of those interactions. So um, the type of data we have um, looks like this. So this would be a typical image that we can obtain from the data. Um, and here we can see this is the diagonal. In the diagonal, there are very high, in, there's lots of interactions because of the local interactions between um, neighboring points. And then uh, long or at longer distances, um, those interactions are going to be smaller or less frequent. So that's why the signal uh, away from the diagonal is much more faint. And if we look at higher resolutions, and actually the, this is the highest resolution um, of uh, two mil, two. 2000 base pairs, we can see that there is a very strong signal along the diagonal and then far away from the diagonal, the signal is not so strong. So those different types of interaction patterns correspond, or those different patterns in the, in the high C map correspond to different types of interactions in the, in the chromatin. And um, essentially there are different, three different types. So one of them is the, on the large scale, we can see compartmentalization. And um, yeah. so uh, here in the compartmentalization, what we can find is that some regions um, tend to segregate and into compartments and those compartments mainly uh, are distinguished between two, main groups and so they do interact within those groups but not with the other group and then at an intermediate length scale we can um sorry at an intermediate length scale we, what we can see it are uh, some very bright um very bright triangles of interactions along the diagonal and this has to do with some contact domains and and so this means that there are some regions, loops, that they have very high interactions within among themselves, but not so many with the rest. And as I showed earlier, then there's this very bright diagonal pattern, which is due to um, polymer interactions. And so, well, the mechanism for uh, compartments, for the formation of compartments is not very well understood. This is uh, when one hypothesis is that it may have to do with phase separation, um, but this needs, still needs to be tested. And um, I'm going to explain about, I'm going to tell you about the contact domains. There's the model of loop extrusion. And this model, uh, essentially there are a few elements involved. So, well, on the one hand, there's the 
uh, chromatin. Um, and then there, there's this type of ring, which is called the cohesin complex. And this ring starts extruding the DNA through itself until it reaches uh, CTCF proteins that are bound to DNA and act as uh, loop boundaries. So whenever the cohesin complex founds these two proteins, then it stops extruding. And then um, maybe after some time, so maybe after about 10 minutes, this cohesin complex um, detaches from DNA. Um, and then during th that time, what happen what's happening inside this loop is that all these points are in very close con well, in very yeah close space, um, and so there are many interactions between points here. And so this has an important repercussion when um, there's a gene sitting here and an enhancer sitting over there, and then they because of their proximity in space, they tend to interact a lot. And so that may have uh, repercussions into the frequency of uh, the um, how many times that gene is being expressed. OK, so there, here I'm just showing some examples. Um, here, of, well, this is what the data looks like. Here we can see the, uh, compart oh, sorry, the contact domains. And here we can see very um, two very bright contact domains, and then one that is not so so bright. But what I find very interesting are these these points here at the top, which indicate which is precisely this picture where there is a loop, and then these points here are in contact in contact very often. Um, and so this one. I also find interesting because these are two loop domains um, that have very high contacts between them, but in between there's a, a boundary that may not be there every, all the time. So sometimes in, instead of having two loop domains, what we have is just one loop domain, and that's how we can see all this faded region. And I, well, our research um, is more focused on other types of patterns and so we found that there's a pattern that we call the jets and those jets are very strong signals that emerge from the diagonal and so well they may have an orientation they may have a length a width and opening and so on um, but typically they look like this and so well we think this is an interesting example because uh, there may be um, more than one cohesing loading here. So this would be the image of having one cohesing here, another here, and so on. And this may be evidence that cohesing is loading at particular points in the in the chromatin. So uh, yeah, so then my, this may be due to that having a uh, loading site here. And well, so these are some of our questions. Um, we want to understand how these jets happen, um, how they depend on the conditions. And uh, of course, we need to keep in mind what are the uh, biological questions. And thank you. All right. Great. Great. Thank you very thank much. You. OK, so Robert has a question. <laughs> OK. Hi, Rosalba. Thank you very much for the super interesting talk. Um, you know, at the beginning, you talked about it's this long um, two centimeter DNA is to fit in a nucleus. And uh, that's remarkable, of course. And then you had, you talked about these loop structures and these chats. So, uh, so, so how does it now relate to, to gene expression in a cell? I mean, is, are these loops now particularly accessible for gene uh -huh. expression or does it mean these are now suppressed? Do we know much about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's very, well, so organizing the chromo chromosome into loops has, some very important consequences. So, for example, having loops doesn't uh, make that there are no knots. And so, so like if I I have my this cable here, um, if I do loops, then this this is just folding. But if I I don't the typical story that you put your your plugs into your pocket and then comes a knot that would not happen in the in the DNA because of this 
way of organizing. So that also ma makes it very um, accessible when there's a particular gene that uh, needs to be transcribed. So it would be as simple as start pulling the DNA and then it will come out just because there are not these loops. And so there are also, well, it's also related to the density of the um, of the chromatin. A areas that are less active are much denser and areas that are more active are less dense. So they yeah, tend to be accessed more often, more frequently. Okay, so so I think that's a question on the chat chat from uh, you know, Nora Morato. Can you give an example of biological scenario correlated with this cascade structure you focus on? Say again. Can I give you? Can you see example? the chat? Can you can you go on the the, the, I the, can chat, the uh, chat? I can uh, maybe the, the the question who posed the question maybe you can you can just talk. Uh, hi. Uh, so yeah, uh, do you have an example? So you described this cascade structure in which you see multiple loops or multiple contact points on one, a single loop. Do you have uh, an example of, 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 of where do you find this? Like, is, is there a biology, biology scenario uh, that where mm -hmm. you see this? Like, do you know of any biological consequence of this sort of structure or is it just you just look at the structure in general. Um, so, um, my quick answer would be no. But uh, so we we have found a very a few handful of these examples, and so uh, although the DNA is is huge, we have found like twenty seven examples of this, um, and it tends to sit between. It's, it's between the um, scale of having compartments and the scale of having contact domains. So we think that it's something in between that uh, draws on both organize, organizing mechanisms. Um, but mm, no, at the, at the moment, we, as far as I know, I don't think, I, I cannot think of any gene or something biological, more biological. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Rosaba. So maybe we can move on to the next talk. Giovanni, are you here? Good. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So our Good. next speaker is Giovanni Sina. He did his Bachelor of Science and Masters at the University of Milan. And then he did his PhD in biology, switching from physics, I think, uh, uh, at the at New York University. So he's a lecturer in, in life sciences at Imperial College, please. All right, very good, thank you. Let me share this, boom. And then we do this. Let me see, can you see the presentation? Yes, yes we can, yeah, I can see okay. your presentation. Okay, I'm gonna put the laser on. Can you see the laser? Yes, I, yes, I can see you. Very good, point. very good. All right, very good. Thank you very much. So basically, I'm just going to take this uh, opportunity. Thank you for, for the opportunity, first of all. I'm just going to take the opportunity to talk about uh, um, just uh, some aspect of a project we've been working on for a couple of years in the lab. Uh, all these people have been involved in this project. Uh, um, but in particular, I think today I'm going to talk about mainly data that has been collected by Nick Oliver, Max Schwartz, and Mandalena Salvalayo more recently, um, just to give you a sense, I would say, about what kind of problems we are dealing with this, in, the, in this lab. We are focused on plant morphogenesis, as you can see from the self-given title of the lab. So uh, let me just start with a, with a simple observation. So when we think about uh, land plants, uh, um, most of us immediately think about the shoot structure in the air, in the atmosphere. But of course, uh, we all know that uh, there is the half of this organism uh, that lives uh, in soil uh, underground. So this is an interesting point, I think, uh, that's worth uh, um, digesting, if you want, that these are organisms 
where half of their body lives in the atmosphere, in the air, and the other half of the body lives uh, underground in a very different environment, which is soil. From the, from the chemical point of view, from the physical point of view, these are very different environments. Um, so how do you deal with this? So one, one crucial uh, point, uh, one crucial uh, uh, problem to solve, I would say, is to integrate signal that comes from the air and, and from soil. In other words, the <clears throat> interaction between these organisms and the environment is quite complex because in reality, this organism is living in two environments at the same time. And this is not completely trivial. There, I don't think there are examples of animals that do this uh, uh, constantly. Obviously, there are animals that, that uh, um, transit from one environment to the other, but having half of your body in one environment, the other half in another environment, it, it gotta be, you know, it's a complex situation. So um, in terms of uh, plant, uh, when we think about plant uh, environment interaction, there is a number of uh, chemical and physical cues that are sensed by plant, both in the shoot and the root system. And uh, the typical response that you can see here is called the tropism, which means essentially modifying the direction of growth of uh, uh, part of the body uh, toward or away the signal. And when we think about signals, uh, what kind of cues are these organisms sensitive? A number, as I said, of molecular and physical cues. I think about gravity, light, water, um, chemical concentration, and so on. But today, I'm going to focus on this electrotropism, which really hints to the um, um, sensitivity to electrical charges uh, by plants. And so how common is this really in, in life? Well, it's quite common actually. This electroreception has been studied in animals quite a lot, especially in fish. For some reason, there's a lot of studies on fish electro electroreception, which results in what people call electrotaxis in animals, which simply means uh, the ability to move the whole body toward or away from, uh, from a source. Um, in non-animal systems, uh, they call it electrotropism, as we say, the, just the, the reorientation of, of, of their body parts, simply because they cannot just you know, move the whole organism around. Um, and so this has been studied in, an, in a number of flowering plants uh, and in a small number of fungi. Uh, but these are very uh, sort of uh, um, simple analysis, if you want, not, not very quantitative, which is a pity because there's a lot that needs to be learned. The bottom line is that very little is understood about uh, the sensing mechanism of uh, the electroreception, if you want, in non-animal system. Very little is understood. And this is one of the things that interests us. So we really wanted to dive in in this and try to make this a little bit more quantitative with modern tools and see how much we can learn about this uh, uh, phenomenon, really. So we've been working with uh, many uh, different plant species, but especially uh, focusing on the plant, on the model plant system Arabidopsis italiana. So the idea is you would like to immerse uh, these roots in, uh, in, a, in a planar simple electric field. And we do this by sticking you know, two electrodes in a, in a liquid medium. So really you're inducing a, a, a small current. Uh, this is a sort of a ionic current in the field, in the, in the liquid medium and a planar field. So what you would like to, uh, so to, in order to do this, uh, we developed a, a modular system. We, we 3D print this thing in the lab. We designed it and 3D printed ourselves in order to accommodate up to five plants in the same system. You have two electrodes on the side and the whole thing is, is uh, put in a, in a transparent box filled with medium. But very quickly you realize that you, what you really would like to do also is to get rid of uh, any gradient of pH, which would come from uh, uh, electrolysis, of course. And uh, also you would like to keep the, the temperature constant because essentially what you're doing here, otherwise is cooking your plants, right? That's what you, you know, we're, we're not cooking vegetables here. So um, to maintain constant temperature and uniform pH, what we do is that we circulate the liquid medium uh, with a system that uh, uh, continuously circulate the, the overall uh, uh, medium into through a uh, temperature control sort of chilling system to maintain the temperature uh, at the desired spot. Um, and then, of course, uh, we put a camera in front of this transparent uh, uh, chamber 
And uh, with a simple Raspberry Pi, we don't need anything uh, fancier than that. We simply take uh, some sort of time-lapse images at relatively low magnification. So what you can get is something like this. Really, this is how the, you know, the images look like. Here I'm showing you sort of a, a five hours a time point every, you know, a picture every, every hour here I'm showing you. But in reality, what we do is you can see here in the zoom in the first hours is that we take a picture every 10 minutes. And that seems to be enough, you know, in terms of temporal resolution for us. So what do we really want to do is to measure, well, we can, do, you, we can measure, measure a number of things, of course, right? That, that's the idea. But one of the things I'm going to show you today is uh, measuring simply, the simplest thing that can come to mind is to, see, to measure the angle between the tip and the gravity vector. And to see how this, you know, behaves in time and try to do a little bit of quantification, nothing too fancy, but something that uh, tell us a little bit about the system and how it behaves. Okay, so you get you get curves uh, uh, of this kind where uh, you can see, um, interestingly, that the root is, roots are behaving differently depending on the uh, strength of the electric field applied. And this is not completely trivial because uh, it suggests that it's not just a zero one response, it's not just a digital response, but the, the system is somehow able to distinguish different strengths uh, of electric field perceived. And that, that's not trivial and tells you something about the mechanism underlying. So one of the early um, control that you wanted to run is something that I liked quite a bit, which was uh, the simple idea of trying to understand whether this is, uh, how much of this is biology and how much is this physics in a way. So is it just the fact that this root somehow is positively charged and it's just a, you know, a positively charged filament to put in an electric field and just respond because of electrostatic, in other words. So we thought of maybe we can slowly kill this root by not disturbing it too much, we slowly kill it and see whether it still responds when you put it in the, it still moves basically when you put it in the field. This, so that, that's why my favorite slide, which I call life is necessary, where we essentially uh, slowly uh, increase the temperature of the system. We get to up to 50 degrees, for example, essentially killing the, the root. We show that it's not growing anymore. Um, and you put it in the field and it doesn't move, right? It doesn't move. So this suggests that you need to be alive. Life is necessary. You need to be alive in order to show this behavior, which, uh, you know, strongly suggests it, it's biology. It's not just a simple physics, which is, which is quite interesting for us. And um, among the, 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 the quantities that we can measure, which is related to this, is this relationship between uh, the actual the angular velocity, how fast the tip is turning, so the angular velocity as a function of its orientation. And, uh, and it's interesting to see that as the root goes to 90 degrees orientation, meaning uh, uh, parallel to the field toward, in this case, toward the negative electrode, which is always the behavior we observe, uh, the angular velocity slows, decreases, right? So the root is slowing down as it reaches the um, horizontal uh, uh, um, configuration, which is an, an, an interesting uh, feature if you want to avoid overshooting, for example, right? So this is what you would design if you want to avoid overshooting. Um, again, I think this would suggest a quite a, a, mo a modulated mechanism, a quite a complex mechanism, which is uh, which suggests some biology behind this. Is not just uh, pure electrostatics to uh, to to have this uh, braking system, if you want. It's quite quite interesting. So, um, in, in just to give you again a sort of a, a flavor of the kind of uh, um, measurement we do and the kind of question we ask. At this point, uh, um, another interesting point is uh, to measure the uh, dose response curve. So, in a way, uh, to see what is the final angle, so that the total response uh, to the field as a function of again the strength of the field. Uh, here we show it in the, in the field or even in the current that we measure through the system. Of course, the two things are related to each other. Um, so what is interesting uh, looking at this dose response curve uh, is that it, it fits pretty well a power law with an exponent uh, between 0, 4 and 0, 3, depending on you know, what, what, how, how you map it. But essentially, um, 
<clears throat> with an exponent that is less than zero five, uh, and uh, and it's it's a power law. So why why is that important? I mean, is is this just numerology, right? You feed it to a power law, so what? Um, that's what I thought at the beginning, but 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 uh, actually, it turns out that in the literature. Uh, sort of classic physiological studies in animals, and I believe this table is actually taken from uh, for plant for uh, humans. Uh, from humans, um, you get uh, um, there's been a discussion in the literature whether these uh, those response uh, um, analysis of sensory systems uh, follow a power law or a log, and it turns out that most of the cases in animal systems they follow a power law, and you can see that the exponents are usually between 0 0.3 and 1. So the exponents that we measure are in this category, which might suggest some uh, universality and some uh, universal response, uh, universal behavior of these uh, biosensors uh, um, in this, in this uh, multi, multicellular organism, uh, which is quite interesting, I think. Um, so let me just quickly go back to the, the root again. So how, how does it turn? That's a, that's a fair question. And we develop a little system to put it on a microscope. Uh, where well, you can see here how it behaves in the electric field, and you can notice that these sides, uh, uh, if you look carefully, these sides are expanding, uh, these cells are expanding a little bit faster than this. And this is not a huge surprise because this is a classic way to bend a system. If you don't have muscles, basically, you expand the one side more than the other. This is very well studied in gravitropin. So that was not a very good, uh, a, a very surprising result. But actually, we wanted to know. Where is the sensor? That is a little bit more uh, unusual. Uh, so we try to, you know, chop the root and see whether it was still able to uh, turn in the field. And you can see here from this side that if you cut up to 400 micron, essentially, roots are still turning normally, as if there's no tomorrow, so no problem there. But if you cut it to 500 microns from the tip, they don't turn anymore. So there's something special in this region here that seems to be necessary for turning. And, and uh, this is a very anatomically, very well described region. It's a transition zone. And I'm, I don't have time to get into that, but it's quite interesting for us. So a final point I would like to make uh, is uh, this uh, observation of what happens for very long time points. So you can see here again, our radial axis is time. And uh, you can see that if you let it go for a very long time, like 15 hours or so, uh, after, after turning, the route seems to realign again to the, uh, gravity, as if it got sort of tired of aligning to the field. So this is an interesting point because in animal system, people would call this habituation, meaning it's, it's like when you have a continuous noise in the background, you get used to it, and after a while you don't hear it anymore, right? So is this an habituation or is the root just dead? Or, you know, it's, it cannot respond anymore to an electric field because the sensor is broken or something. Did we break the system or it just got bored, right? Let, let me use this uh, uh, strange word. So what you like to do is try to kick the system here. Can we kick it in a way and ensure that it's still able to respond to a electric system, to a, to a, to a electric field? And this is what we did. We 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 cranked on, we cranked up the the system, the field to three volt per centimeter, and boom, you see that the root is still responding, which is quite remarkable, suggesting that this was indeed just habituation. The root was not dead, and the system is not broken; it's still able to respond. So the control would be to have a set of roots that never see, completely naive, never see a field before, and then you turn on the field. You see that they actually behave differently than the one that got habituated, suggesting that the habituation does some, something to the system. Maybe there is some, some sort of memory in this. Um, so just a final, final slide, really, two slides uh, quickly. It's about uh, what kind of application. So we recently got some, uh, um, um, funding to explore this idea of building a hybrid system between a plant uh, and a hydrogel system to, um, to um, take advantage of this electrotropism in order to grow plants uh, in, uh, in any kind of configuration, essentially against gravity, right? The electrotroping would take over gravity and would allow you to grow this root system and this plant in any possible configuration, which is obviously important for uh, 3D farming and vertical farming, but that might be also uh, fun to push it to the limit and instead of fighting gravity, really take over gravity in microgravity conditions so that you might be able maybe to one day grow your lettuce and tomatoes on, the, on some orbital stations. 
So this would be my, my final slide. And again, I'd like to thank uh, everybody in the lab through the couple of years who students uh, who participated to this uh, exciting project. So I'm happy to answer questions if there's anything. Uh, thank you very much for the really interesting talk. OK, so we've got an, uh, a question from Naomi. Yes, yeah. Hi, thanks, Jeff. And as you really thanks for a really interesting talk. I actually have a similar question to the one in the chat. It just popped out after I raised my hand, but I'm wondering what would be the biological significance of this response to, you know, that electrophilic um, subtropism? Because um, so in, in is you know like other tropic tropic responses are to, you know going toward what the plants need to live or going away from what they don't wouldn't like. Um, so, yeah, and also, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm also wondering if in the soil, maybe the lower the soil, you know, the more toward the bottom, if the electro, electro, <laughs> that the signal is stronger, so it's using actually sort of uh, the cues to orient itself to grow toward the, the lower part of the soil. Something like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's a very fair question. So, what is the adaptive value? Biologists would say, right? Why, why would evolution select a plant that is sensing electric fields? The truth is that, um, well, we don't know what the truth is. That's a big, uh, big way to start the answering. But what we think it is uh, is uh, that uh, essentially you are thinking about uh, ions, right? So ions they are charged. They generate uh, clearly an electric field. So if you have a large pocket of ions with the same charge um, concentrated in one pocket, for example, in soil, that might create a field that is uh, you know, strong enough to be sensed. Um, ions means a nutrient for uh, uh, plants. Um, so the, the, the simplest, uh, the most obvious idea would be that this is yet another sensing mechanism to smell where your nitrogen ions are, where your nutrients are in soil in the form of ions. Um, it's also true that some, uh, you know, soil, as I mentioned before, it's a very complex environment and it's full of other living organisms, like uh, microorganisms. Some of them are pathogens, and some of them are good uh, uh, symbiotic uh, organisms. All of them carry some sort of charge. So, for example, the the membrane of uh, micro most micro microorganism membranes are actually negatively charged. Um, and so, the idea that a root might be able to sense uh, a concentration of my a pocket of microorganism in soil might be helpful at the end of the day, right? Either you want to go to them or you want to escape from them. Root tips themselves. Uh, believe it or not, are negatively charged, or at least they are not, you know, not neutral. Right? So there's a distribution of charges, which is a, a non-uniform. So that might be also, so they also generate a weak electric fields. So that might also be a way to sense the presence of other um, uh, uh, roots in soil, which essentially means a competition. Um, so everything so we have can, a couple and, more questions from the audience. So so maybe yeah uh, yeah, yeah that's it that's it that gives right, you a flavor of what I'm thinking. <laughs> Fantastic. So Sam Whitby, uh, I think it's about the same question. Would you like to add to that, Sam? Did Giovanni cover that already? Okay. So maybe I, I moved on to Tom's question. Sorry, sorry my, I was muted. Um, oh sorry. Okay. I just wanted to know whether this could be a passive effect to do with just, you know, the, the fact that the plant is living and therefore has negative charges or positive charges, or whether this is like something that could be preserved and, you know, uh, requires energy to keep as a function. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. What do you mean, what do you mean by passive, non-passive, living, non-living, or uh, what do you mean exactly? Is it is this just a, fu a function of the natural charges that would ac accumulate within the root, or is this something that the root has to actually? Like, oh yeah, yeah. Work? Well, well that, yeah, yeah. That's what we try to address by cooking the root, right? You 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 put it at 50 degrees. Root is not moving anymore. It's essentially dead. Not really dead, but it basically doesn't move anymore, and uh, and uh, it doesn't respond to the field anymore. So it's not just uh, some charges accumulate on the root that just by electrostatic uh, drug the filament around. Is, is that what you're thinking? Does that answer your question? 
<laughs> yes, uh, just as it, would the cooking the root definitely kill these ch the passive charges that are accumulated? Is that is that the the explanation? No, the idea would be that it's 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 not you know all all the biological pathways would not be active because the the root is dead, uh, but you still have charges there. It's just a question of accumulation of charges. And so it, since it doesn't move, it means that whatever electrostatic is there, it's not enough to lift the, you know, the weight of the root. It's not just about that. Right. Okay, so Tom has a question. Tom Udrich. Uh, yeah, um, thanks for the talk. Um, do you have any idea, so you talked about it being cellular extension, asymmetric cellular extension actually causes the roots to bend. Do you have any idea about what the sort of molecular molecular mechanism to get to that point is? No, that's a that's a, that's a big question. So it is since this is exactly the same mechanism using gravitropism, it there is a lot understood about the actual cell cell expansion, of course, and the asymmetric cell expansion in in gravitropism. It involves the asymmetric distribution of an important hormone called auxin that is part of the transduction of the signal, if you want. Uh, yeah. And we actually prove that in this case, auxin is, is, is has a very minor role in this. Uh, I didn't show this data, but we have that. Um, but we, for, you know, crucially, we don't even know in this case what the sensor is, and we also don't know what is the, the what are the transduction uh, steps between the sensor and what uh, you know an engineer would call the actuator, which is essentially you know how do you actually move. Um, yes. So yeah, okay. the short answer so is very, very little is known unknown. about. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Great. So maybe we end with uh, Robert's question. So the last question. Okay. Hi, Trani. So maybe I, I keep it short. So you talked about these different laws, the Stevens law with the power law and then the Weber-Fechner law. And um, the Weber-Fechner law, of course, makes sense to me at least that, um, that the, the, the organism tries to sense relative changes with respect to some background stimulus. So what is the rationale between the, the Stevens law, the power law? Um, is there some design principle as well which motivates that? No, the only thing that people say uh, in, in, in animal physiology is that, oh, look, uh, there, is a, there is an exponent which is less than one, so you're damping, really. It's the opposite of an amplification, right? You're really up damping the signal, and this is usually done in a situation where the signal is very strong, like visual, a lot of light you get, so you would like to damp it down the response. So here, I'm a little bit baffled really because i thought i would have thought of the opposite i would have thought that these weak electric fields are, are very weak that would suggest that you know weak respect to what to the sensitivity of the sensor so if anything this suggests that the sensor is very very sensitive sensitive and so it needs a, a damping down of the signal but since we don't know what the sensor is we're still we're still in yeah. in, in high waters here yeah <laughs> Great. So thank you to all the speakers in this session. So Robert, um, do we have a break now? You you are muted. Unmute. Yeah. Still muted. You are still muted. Uh, we have a sorry. We have a five minute break, so we reconvene at uh, twenty six past. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, welcome back to the third session. Our first speaker in this session is Robert. So Robert did his PhD at the University of California, Davis in Daniel Cox's lab, and he did a postdoc in Princeton in Ned Wingreen's lab, 
and he's currently the Professor of, of Systems Biology at Imperial in the Department of Life Sciences. Um, he leads the Biological Physics Group and he also leads Imperial's Physics of Life Network. So over to you, Robert. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my slide and can you hear me? Yeah, I can see it and hear you clearly. Very good. So today I wanted to talk about uh, morphospace, that means uh, the shape space of cell and the dynamics of, of that space as well, and then the dimensionality of cell behavior. So I will talk mostly about large eukaryotic cells, which have this nucleus and how these changes um, uh, in shape occur. And in particular, then I want to focus on this low dimensional space. And here's just a picture of from a principal component analysis, looking at a, in an example of this low dimensional space. So what I find super exciting about science is that it uh, happens over very many time scales and length scales, let's say five orders in, in terms of cell biology, and so at each level there are new rules emerging. So we could think about the lowest levels, let's say as physics very important, that let's say ligands binding receptors, if you like. But the question is really, you know, what are these physical uh, constraints and also if cells are pushing themselves towards them. And then at the next level, we, we, we approach this level of molecular and cell biology, and then we see these very complicated regulatory pathways. And then if you go even further in, in scale, then we can think of all these molecular um, microscopic processes reading out on the membrane and deforming the cell. And uh, if you talk about sequences of these shapes in, 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 in times, then we have cell behavior. So then you can say, oh, well, we have uh, many different cells, so we have a tissue, then we could talk about the physiology of the tissue. If you had many uh, neurons, you would have a brain. We could talk about psychology. And if you had many individuals, we can go into uh, sociology. So this was very nicely put in words by Phil Anderson, and most people probably know this. And this article was different, and more recently in Trendstrom's article is about the hierarchical structures of nature. So this also creates a lot of challenges, how to bridge these different lengths and time scales. And even, you know, in very long time scales, we reach a limit of non-stationarity potentially. So the lifetime of a cell, if you like. And what I find really fascinating is how, um, um, you know, uh, purposeful behavior, maybe even intelligent behavior emerges from these uh, microscopic rules. Um, so I want to talk about these different levels very briefly as an introduction. So this is uh, physics level, and there has been really nice work by Burke and Purcell in the 70s, which also influenced me quite a bit. Um, they basically ask if you have a small cell, how accurately can it sense a ligand concentration in its environment? And uh, you have these little patches where they sense a ligand, if you think receptors. And so they came up with this very simple model. So they were interested in this relative uncertainty of this ligand concentration. You make a few assumptions, Poisson process, whatever. And in the end, you get these cute formulas, which depend only on physics and geometry. So you have the diffusion constant, which is important, the size of the cell, and the measurement time over which it can average. We can also go to a single receptor and think about the binding unbinding curve in a certain amount of time. Burke and Purcell thought the best a cell can do is take the average and infer the ligand concentration, but actually the cell can do better by doing maximum uh, likelihood or even kinetic proofreading, but they cost an energy. And so also what they really, what they found is as well, which is exciting, is that cells seem to reach the limit, they seem to be optimized. So at the next level, I mentioned already these pathways, and this is really the domain of, of biology and which can be very complicated. So you have the ligand cyclic AMP, which binds, let's say, in a particular example, to the receptor. And then you have all these parallel pathways. And uh, in the end, you know, people just draw arrows to actin polymerization or retraction of the rear. And actin is these sort of red filaments which deform the cell. And then people draw an arrow to chemotaxis down here. Um, you know, how cells can move up a chemical gradient, but how this evolves in a space and time sense is not answered in these networks. You could zoom in in the actin polymerization and you realize that there's this huge zoo of molecules regulating things, branching, bundling, binding to the membrane and so on. This is a very complicated level to work at and maybe one can hope at a higher level um, it's getting easier. So if you talk about behavior, we could talk about stereotypical behavior, which is these reoccurring behaviors, which are very important. And um, to make life simple, we could start with something simple like a vertebrate, like a horse. We hopefully know a lot about it. And um, of course, you might imagine this, the behavior is limited by the limited amount of joints and muscles you have, um, and that it's, it's, that it's actually quite easy. But um, you know, since the late 19th century, um, artists with an astute eye for things, they think they got things wrong. So when you look at a galloping horse, uh, they painted these flying horses with all the hoofs detached. 
And um, this turned out to be not right. Um, by doing very careful um, photography um, with short shutter times in MyBridge, and you might know the story, in uh, Palo Alto, he, he looked at these very carefully and he, you know, he found flying horses, you have them here, but in this case, the, the legs are very different in configurations. If, one, if the legs are spread out like in the paintings, then one hoof is normally on the ground. Um, so now if you talk about, um, and I hope the movie is playing, um, uh, when you talk about cells, now all these landmarks are missing. You don't have eyes, you don't have legs and so on. And you see these morphing shapes, um, in particular here, cell moving up a chemical gradient. And it forms these protrusions, these active and protrusions. They seem to split at some point, and the cell has to make a decision to go left or right, and so on. And so, what I'm very interested in is understanding this shape, how to describe it, in particular, also then how to relate it to these lower scales, these physical principles. So, how do we do this all? So, as a postdoc, um, I extended the working per cell limit to gradient sensing. So, here's the uncertainty of, of gradient, but it depends again in the end on the same. Um, uh, constants, here's the mean concentration versus cells. And then you have to bridge some of the scales. So in experiments, you look at the chemotactic index, how well moved towards a uh, pipette with some chemical coming out. And you see close to it, it works very well. It's close to one, um, but far away, you know, it works less, less, less accurate, of course, we would expect that. But what then the model uh, did um, was it predicted that all this data on the left would collapse uh, onto a single curve on the right. And uh, if you plot it only as a function of the signal to noise ratio, meaning the gradient versus the noise, which is the background, uh, and so depended only a single fitting parameter. But of course, we didn't know exactly what these chemical concentrations look like from a pipette. It was just guesstimated. So, um, so we, we did some experiments or a collaboration with Doris Heinrich, looking at the chemical gradients and microfluidics at the same time as looking at the cells, and then looking at hundreds of cells. And you can see um, that the thing is uh, nicely collapsing on this fundamental limit without any refitting. What it then also allowed us to do is um, ask the question, is the behavior of cell different in uh, shallow gradients down here, small signal noise ratio versus steep gradients? Is the shape and behavior different? Um, so what we did is then, you know, looking at these many cells, we can do principal component analysis. So you ask, what are the modes of variability around some average shape of the cell? And um, uh, what we found then is, um, uh, somewhat surprisingly, is that only three modes are required to produce 90%, uh, let's say, of this variability you have in your data. And we call some elongation, splitting, and polarization. Um, we've also found then, um, that in shallow gradients or signal to noise ratio being low, cells form these protrusions, and that's um, uh, characteristic. And in steep gradient, things are different. But not only shape space is low dimensional, even the behavior seems low dimensional. So you can put these cells back in this low dimensional space. And you see that in shallow gradients, um, cells move alternating between elongation and splitting. It goes back and forth. It's like a run and tumble movement. While in steep gradients, where the signal is very strong, cells essentially keep their shape and then they just move in the right direction. This is uh, more like the compass model um, in, this, uh, in this field. Um, very briefly, also, one can reproduce these shapes quite easily using a Meinhardt model. It's effectively a reaction diffusion model on a, on a flexible membrane. All you need is three species, a local activator, which is in green, which pushes the membrane out, and then the local inhibitor destroys it, and then the pseudopod splits, and then the global inhibitor effectively suppresses um, lateral pseudopods. So the principal component analysis looks very similar. It's not surprising, I think. These are just the low the energy excitations of the membrane. But then when you look at um, uh, but look at behavior, it looks very similar to the to the to the experiments, and this I think is not trivial. Just to complete this now, this little idea. So this was just a, an undergraduate project, but I'm included it here to complete the cycle. So what does it have to do all with the shapes and behavior with the accuracy of sensing in terms of chemotaxis? So here we did a very simple model where we had on one hand um, a very basic model where the cell decides between left and right of pseudopods and moves up six sect, up the gradient. And it works very well in shallow gradients because it's very noisy, it's biased random work, we expect it to work. In steep gradients then we would expect, um, uh, we, it doesn't work so well and then we have a simple compass model where the cell finds the direction as accurately as possible and that only works very well when you have a strong signal to noise ratio. Um, 
so I talked about the shapes and now can we predict anything in particular about the behavior over long times? And so here we use the maximum entropy method, um, which is in this case called maximum caliber. Caliber because the diameter of a tube de determines the flow speed and caliber is then the, the maximum caliber is the dynamic version of it. Um, so what you do here is then you write down a Shannon entropy like expression. Um, and this is the probability of a trajectory in our case. And if you would maximize this now with respect to these probabilities, you would get um, a flat distribution, so the maximum entropy distribution. So, but now the cool thing is you can also add constraints from experiments uh, like these observations, these observables, and this is like Roche multipliers. And then you can redo this and you, get, um, you can capture these, um, these constraints. You get Boltzmann-like probability distributions as well, um, what you would expect actually. And so the question is now, what are these trajectories? What can you do with it? So these trajectories are actually now the trajectories in this principal component, in this shape space. So what we do is then we look at trajectories, let's say in these different principal components, it's just an illustration. We look at a certain time point and the neighboring time point. It's just a few seconds away. And then we ask in the data, how often does is one principal component going up or down, or is it going up and followed by another going up and so on, and even also between the principal components. So once you train your maximum caliber model, you can make predictions. In particular, you can ask, are the predicted probabilities matching the observed probabilities? So you look for patterns of behavior like up and down and things like that, little words like a dictionary. And you can see the correlated model uh, works very well, or these are only short-term correlations and the non-correlated doesn't work very well. And here's an example. You could also say, hey, I give you some uh, shapes. Can you now tell me the difference if it's a, a healthy or wild type cell versus a mutant or a drug treated cell? So shapes are very similar. That so discrimination wouldn't work, but I can I can use the Lagrangian multipliers, which describes the transitions between different shapes, um, and make uh, very good classifiers based on this. So that works very well. Um, so 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 lastly, I I wanted to briefly talk about how to bridge these different space and, and temporal scales, and this was done uh, work done with Brian Stramer lab at um, at uh, King's College uh, London and with a postdoc Dana Schumacher. Here, I don't talk about the theory, I just show a little bit the examples from the experiments. So how does it work now? So in classic textbooks, you see the cell migration is this five step cycle, which you show on the left, where effectively at some point, step two, the cell makes a uh, extension by actin polymerization and pulls itself forward by adhesion and contraction. But we see now this leading edge, which is so important in this formalism, is actually not very well correlated um, with the direction of motion. Uh, even if you look at the largest extension, it doesn't work very well. And so this is against this dogma of, of cell biology, actually. So what is then really important, um, what we found is that uh, actin flows in the cell are the key thing. So yes, these retrograde actin flows towards the sink where they are degraded, these filaments, and this is highly stable. So the outer correlation is highly, uh, is, is very strong and um, uh, even stronger sense the direction of cell motion while the extensions don't work very well. And uh, you don't have any steps, no delays effectively we found. So the more integrated view is now that we have these flows, these actin flows, and they are very stable and they integrate all these fast processes at the membrane where the sensing happens in these little protrusions and so on. Um, yeah, what is then the um, take home message from this talk? Um, I, I talked about the physics in particular, what are the physical limits and if the cell can push themselves towards it and how this then translates to cell behavior, which is fascinating because it goes over these orders of magnitude. I also talked about this maximum entropy method where we can with very simple um, statistical physics um, predict um, long-term cell behavior even over, over minutes and hours. Also these correlations are only uh, seconds we included in our formalism. And lastly, I bridged, I try to bridge these different uh, times and length scales by looking at these actin flows, which seems to integrate all these fast processes into this highly persistent engine of the cell, if you like. Um, so some of these things I talked about were um, uh, a little bit older to put it in this uh, coherent picture, but what is currently all going on in the group is we're trying to extend this to uh, three dimensions, um, three dimensional cell shapes. And um, this is quite interesting because of course there's this extracellular matrix and, and different modes of migration. We're also thinking about uh, collectives. 
not only of cells, but also of, of nematodes. And then um, we also think about other ways to do um, low dimensional representations. Instead of principal component analysis, we could uh, do deep learning uh, via outer encoders. It's another way to do it. And finally, I think an interesting, fascinating question is, can we extend ideas of intelligence to cells? So of course we would need a definition of intelligence, which doesn't involve, involve uh, a brain or so, uh, even a nervous system. And one way to do it would be to look at these fast protrusions, these extensions of the cell, how the cell can sample and predict almost its, its future and based on that can make informed decisions. So that's an, these are all ongoing projects. Um, here, I just wanted to take the, take the opportunity to um, thank in particular my current group. Uh, here are some snapshots from teams and as well my collaborators and some funding sources. So, so thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, are there any questions? So there's one on the, the chat from Bati Zakirov. If you'd like to, uh, on um, whether the PCA is performed on raw pixel data or whether there's some representation that's more amenable to PCA. Yes, it's, it's a good question. So we, so we, um, we, we, what we, what we did first is, um, we uh, we followed, you know, you do segmentation, obviously, in the beginning. So you do segmentation to get the outline, so you don't apply directly to the cell images. And once you have the outline, uh, then, um, of course, you could try now to do it directly on these outlines. But what we did is uh, we, we converted this XY coordinate of the outline into Fourier space, did actually a, 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 a power spectrum. Um, and the idea with the power spectrum was that we don't have to worry about the orientation of cells. It's effectively the Fourier transformation of the order correlation function. And in that way, it was a, the, 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 the benefit was that we don't have to uh, worry about aligning cells anymore, um, which is, you know, shape shouldn't be depending on size or alignment or orientation. And that's also why these principal components are so symmetric and a little bit odd looking. But otherwise, it was a cool descriptor. Good question. And, and does it make any difference whether you um, uh, take your principal components just from the cells at, say, a, a particular time point, or do you actually include all time points when you generate your, your principal components? Yeah, good question. Of course, you know, you would like to use as much data as you can. You're always limited on that side. But um, there's, of course, no point in taking all these uh, um, all the, um, uh, time snapshots because you know you see essentially the same thing again and again. So, so what you can do is you can calculate things like um, just on the raw images, other correlations as well, and see where things decay in time. And then you can make sure you sample new images effectively where the decay has happened. So you you, you sample you subsample effectively, and um, and so you don't uh, bias things by just looking at the same cell again and again, which didn't move very much. Yeah, so it's it did said yeah. Are there any other questions? I can't see any other hands up. Or so maybe, maybe I ask, a, I have a question. Oh, so go for it. Not, not scientific question, but I'm just curious. So you are in the life sciences department and you do biophysics. So now let's play the devil's advocate. Oh no. Should, should, <laughs> I mean, I, I just am curious about your response. So should, should this kind of research be done in the physics department at all? Or it's, <laughs> should be done in the life sciences or this question is just boot is not relevant. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess if you think of sort of a more say Anglo-Saxon model, um, especially the American model, um, the things are much more fluid. Yeah, In the physics department, you can do quite a lot of biology, I would say. In a biology department, it's quite, um, you can do, you know, theory and so on. Um, I think it's quite similar in the UK and especially at Imperial College. You know, we have our center for uh, systems biology, and there are other people with a physics and mathematics background. So I think, you know, the distinction is, of course, very much blurred now, I guess. But then in other countries like Germany, I would say um, it's quite traditional still, with some exceptions like, the, you know, Dresden and so on, the Dresden model. Um, so I, I think, you know, in, in, in Germany, you would do, say, you know, in a physics department, you better do really physics. And, and, you know, you have to be careful to stay on the physics side of things. So it smells and looks like physics. But uh, but yeah, I think it's it's become certainly um, 
yeah, just more more blurry, I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, so there's one one question from Nate Goering. Um, I don't know, Nate. Would you like to ask the question in person? Sure. I was just uh, very interesting with stuff on the on the actin. The um, do you think that that's a that brings together that model sort of unifies distinct modes of migration, right? Because people have talked about lamella polio migration, Lebing front, low friction models. Does that all sort of map back onto the sort of idea that it's really the act and flow that drives? Everything? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good question. So, um, so you could think like you know before I talked about these pseudopods, it's this two-dimensional driven uh, amoeba. And, uh, and then, you know, in the textbook example, I think you talk, one talks normally more about this adhesion, um, mesenchymal type of migration. And, you know, all these modes of migration, do they really exist? And that's almost like a controversy in the, in the literature. Um, so so we, do, we think, especially, you know, Brian Stramer, I, I hope I, I'm sort of paraphrasing Brian Stramer correctly. He's an expert on it. But, I, but, but he thinks, I think, that these actin flows they are, they are uh, universal across uh, modes of migrations and cell types, even if in one case it looks more pseudopod driven, in other case you have Scylla melopodia, and in another case you might have something else again in the blepping and so on. I think underlying is always this flow. I think this is he sources or resources in multiple cell types, not all of them were included in the paper even. Um, yeah, so this is. So this is, I think now, the, I would think this is the engine, which is fantastic, I think. So I was always wondering how this all works together, how do, how the cell knows what to do at the front and so on. It's all emergent and integrated into these flows. So, so I like this picture quite a lot. Cool. Great. Well, thanks very much, Robert. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll move on to our next speaker now, which is uh, Jenny Porton. So Jenny uh, did her undergraduate degree at the University of Sheffield, and she's currently in the Principles of Biomolecular Systems group led by Thomas Albridge in bioengineering at Imperial so, um, uh, Hi so there. So I'm just going to uh, share my presentation. So can it's uh, just coming. everybody see this? And then I will. It just seems to be a pause here. Okay, so can, it's on its way. can you see that I've now yes, started the presentation? Your, I can see your PowerPoint now. Fantastic. So, hi there, my name is um, Jenny, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about templated copying, which, as we know, is, is very, it's a, an absolutely standard process in biology and why it's actually quite hard to do and what the kind of limitations are in us being able to achieve this synthetic. So, um let's so basically the act of taking a template that contains information and then forming a polymer on top of this which then separates is absolutely essential to the development of biological complexity and i'm going to kind of make the case that without this mechanism we wouldn't be able to develop a kind of any of the level of complexity we see in kind of extant biological systems so Biological processes rely on complex molecules, complex processes using complex molecules, which must assemble autonomously. We can't kind of, you know, step by step um, assemble all these things. They have to assemble themselves in the body. So designing a complex object which can self-assemble spontaneously requires careful designing of components. Additionally, what we would do is we would design a series of components which have specific bonds between them, which allow them to settle into a ground state, which is this complex molecule. This requires quite a large library of components. Even a, uh, an object as simple as a cross takes three distinct components. And I'm just going to show you a picture of a couple of biological proteins. So on the left, we have actin, which is a chain of 376 amino acids. And on the left, we have insulin, which is 51 amino acids. Now, what we see here is a very, very complex structure. These kind of spirals and these arrows represent very, very specific layouts of the amino acids in the chain. And it's essential that these proteins fold into these shapes in order for them to be useful in the body. Now, we can, and then obviously, 
protein misfolding, as various people have explained, is responsible for things like Parkinson's disease, things like Alzheimer's disease. So it really is essential that these proteins form their things correctly. Now, it's possible to accurately program protein folding using the sequence of the amino acids in the chain. However, even very, very small differences in the amino acid chain can cause proteins to misfold. So you have to target a very, very specific sequence. And there is no way to pre-design molecular components specific enough to target the specific sequence required for this thing to fold with only 20 building blocks. There are only 20 amino acid building blocks. And if you compare that to the three that we need to take across, it's just nothing like enough. It's absolutely impossible. A possibly even more compelling example is the fact that the ribosome is an even more complex object than either of these two I have on the screen. It's about 3,000 RNA nucleotides, I think. And that's made up of a library of four, four proteins. So it's absolutely... Um, it's, it, it's basically an absurd proposition that we'd be able to pre-design all the interactions required to, to form these complex objects. Now, we argue that templating is the solution. If you can set up a template which all of these individual amino acids can interact and then polymerize along the chain, then suddenly this problem is very straightforward. All you have to do is pre-design some form of complementarity by which the right thing wants to be attracted to the right place on the template and the the problem is solved now of course one of the most important things is you do then have to peel the product off the template otherwise you've kind of just pushed your problem back a level right you've just said okay we, we, we've said okay we're going to use a template but then you ask how do you form the complex template so it is important these templates are recyclable and you might ask, where do these templates come from kind of initially? And we argue that if you have a simple template that can self-replicate, that can compete with other simple templates that can self-replicate, they can um, slowly, they, they will compete, they will slowly increment in complexity, and complexity will kind of be stored in the template as it iterates. So we believe that this question of how do you get something build on a template and then separate is absolutely essential understanding all of kind of complexity in biology. So let me tell you about what the kind of state of the art is in developing synthetic self-replicators. Now crucially when I say a synthetic self-replicators I'm saying things without enzymes to help us. I think of a polymerase as a magic copying machine and if we use the body's magic copying machine to do copying We've kind of cheated, right? But what we're asking is, how can you engineer a system using only monomers um, that, that combine into polymers that will spontaneously self-replicate? Now, it turns out that the hardest part isn't necessarily getting accuracy. The hardest part is forming this accurate copy on this template and then getting it separate. Because in many ways, asking the two things to separate, you have to, you're almost possibly going to blow the whole thing apart, right? Now, the longer your polymer is, the greater the cooperativity, as in the greater the attraction between the copying template. So, and much more easier to create a dimer than it is to create something much longer. And obviously things like RNA strands, proteins, and DNA are much, much longer than dimers or trimers. And so it's we, we really are asking questions of these, these very kind of long objects, which will have huge amounts of cooperativity. An alternative route is varying your background condition, but eventually we want to step away from that. Let me show you kind of what is the kind of best we've been able to do so far. So this is a paper by a guy called von Kiedrowski. I've just noticed I can't see my mouse. Oh, here it is. Can you guys see my mouse okay? Yes. Good. So I. So what what they do here is they have um, A A B B A B and B A dimers, which act as templates, and they basically can form. Uh, basically, they have monomers that are settled on top of them, 
and then the two things separate. So here we have an AA being attracted to a BB, forming this kind of complex and then separating into two different dimers. So we, this is a kind of templating system for dimers. And this was actually done in 1994. Now, this is quite a nice set of graphs where they show that if you have your um, AA, BB, AB, and BAs just growing spontaneously just out of a pool of monomers, they do grow, they do accumulate, but very slowly. But if you add an AB template, you see an increase in the amount of AB. If you add a BA template, you see the amount of increase in the amount of BA. Adding AA gets you more BB because of the kind of complementarity of the reactions. And equally, adding BB gets you more AA. So it's clear that this group has successfully used templates to catalyze the production of dimers. So that's really, you know, that's that's the, the kind of best we've got in a kind of truly autonomous context. I suspect that there are there is a group that has um, possibly created trimers, but I've not actually been able to track them down. So I've stuck to the dimers. Now, an alternative method you can use is by using a time varying condition. Now, this is um, by a group, Dieter Brown's group, and I think this personally is a very, very impressive piece of work. What they have is they have a thermal vent which has a hot side and a cold side, and this forms a kind of convection current around it. And what you find is if you place in a, a polymer, then monomers from solution accumulate in the cross section and the two things separate in the hot section. And now the two things can now accumulate in the uh, cold section again. And so you get this kind of exponential growth in theory. Now, what you see is if, again, if you add no template, you will, have, you will see no growth. But as they add template, you see you do get accumulation of polymers. And so they are successfully making um, polymers based on a template, and the template is actually 143 nucleotides. And so this is much closer to the size of, say, a protein. And this is a really, really impressive piece of work. And it should be noted that actually these um, these polymers are random. We, we, we don't get any form of accuracy in this one. And that is really crucial. And secondly is, while this is possibly a really good analogy for what might have happened at the kind of origin of life scenario it's not it wouldn't be outrageous to think that early rna self-replicators existed in kind of thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean at some point biology made the transition from needing these like time varying cyclic conditions to being able to do this completely autonomously so we need to ask the question how can that start happening now just take some time not. So if I, so it's quite clear that given we can't do this um, at the moment, and we, and we, sorry, we can't, we can't make this happen synthetically, and it's quite clearly an extremely important reaction. We clearly need a better theoretical understanding. So my job for the last three or four years has been to develop a nice kind of theoretical underpinning of various aspects of templated copying. But my work would take quite a lot more time to explain on top of this. So I'm actually going to switch to introduce you to a, uh, to, oh, I've, I've missed a bit, sorry. So, uh, we, we, so for clarity, most theoretical work in the field hasn't considered the process of separation. So if I through this little diagram of a polymer growing on a template, they consider the settling of the polymer on the template, but they don't let the two things separate. And as we've discussed, this is absolutely vital to the understanding. And it also really underpins a lot of physics. And so my work for the last four years has been considering the consequences of considering this separation explicitly. However, my work is going to take rather too long to explain than I have in the rest of this presentation. So I want to introduce you to a couple of my colleagues who've done some rather snappier and more exciting work than I. So this is Geordie on the left. He's a theory PhD student. And then this is Javi, um, who is an experimental biochemist. And what Geordie has been doing is he's been asking questions such as we've kind of been able to 
So in all my work, I've assumed that copies have grown on templates and separated. I've not really asked under what circumstances that happened. I've kind of talked about how separation is super important, but I've never actually questioned how you force that to happen. This is something that Geordie has been thinking about. And what Geordie has found is that vital to this is that the formation of the bonds between corresponding polymers on the template actually weakens the interaction between copy and template. And this is something that Havi has been able to make happen in strand displacement. So we use, so in the same way that we were inspired by birds and we made an aeroplane, we aren't actually using individual nucleotides as our monomer. We're actually using pure strands of DNA as monomers. Now, DNA is capable of performing something called a strand displacement reaction, whereby something where, where two things are stuck together and then a second thing that is more, it is more favorable to be stuck together than the first one comes and pushes one of them away. Now we're using this kind of reaction to form bonds between templates and it's actually possible if we do that for our strand displacement reaction to destabilize part of the bond between copy and templates when the when the backbone bond is formed and so i'm just gonna and this this is this is really nice stuff we've managed to um demonstrate that this reaction works and we're starting to get accumulation of dimers so that's a really fantastic piece of experimental work and i'm hoping that if anybody wants to ask me questions about the experimental work Javi will be very keen to answer them because i know limited amount of process but I oh so what we so we've we've recently published a paper um so this is my own work this is Javi's work where he talks about how um where he talks about the actual mechanism we've developed for both creating a copy on a template and separating them again and it's a really impressive piece of work and I would invite you to go um have a look at it so yeah thank you very much it's me Great, thank you very much, Jenny. I can see Robert and uh, Joy and both have their hands up. So let's start with Robert. Okay, Jenny, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so I was wondering uh, how you would, I guess, see the long-term aim, or say, how would you define success? So you you talked about replication being important on a template, and that's one level of success. But then also, of course, it has to separate from the template, otherwise, you know, it doesn't really uh, work. It would sort of end at this moment, your yeah. saturation of the templates. And then I guess, you know, what is then the next level? Is it a question of length of the, of the RNA strands? Uh, so, or is it really about explaining origin of life? So what is the ideal outcome? So the, there's a few tasks, right? And what we've actually found is that accuracy turns out to be much, much easier than hitting the target length. Hitting a target length is, is, is a much, much more and a convoluted problem. Now, there's two things. For one, at the moment, as I as I kind of said in the presentation, experiments are really limited. At the moment, our experiments are also limited. But if we can get to trimers and then formers and on, then that's a kind of a mechanism that really is generalizable to these much more straps. But the first thing is kind of getting a mechanism which can go beyond dimers where you can kind of sequentially grow on and on. And then the second thing would be, once you've managed to get something that can, in theory, grow longer than divers, getting it to stop at that point. And those things are both a non-trivial non question. So if we can grow a 30 mer, but actually sometimes it's a 10 mer and sometimes it's a 40 mer, that's, that's, it's, it's an impressive piece of work, but it's not actually exactly what we want. So we're looking at kind of making these, this kind of length consistency Thank you. Uh, all right, so maybe I, I can ask my question. <clears throat> so so in your talk, you said you want to avoid using enzymes. So I thought you were considering a equilibrium scenario, but then in, your, in the paper on the top right corner, it says far from equilibrium. Yes. So, so, so you are not considering a equilibrium copying mechanism. Exactly. And in fact, though, like I would argue that there's no such thing as a as kind of truly equilibrium copying mechanism because in order to create something accurate right you're creating a low entropy state so you're having to push this thing 
And also we we kind of want these things to happen by basically we're pushing them down chemical gradient. And in the body, of course, where there is a kind of huge abundance of fuel in the form of ATP. So biology is a, a hugely alkaline system. So I think that equilibrium copying for me is a thing that can do a really good job of explaining why you get a copy that settles on a template do absolutely nothing with getting it to separate again and adding that kind of condition means you have to start pushing things out of equilibrium but where is in your copying mechanism so you just basically say some of the rates does not have to obey detail balance and you design it that way yeah so we, we design it so that the whole system is downhill it's pushing it in the direction of copying so right. the idea that forming first your your copy template bond and then your backbone bond is downhill. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you. Enjoyed your talk. So moving on to the last talk um, in the session and also the last uh, talk in the symposium. Um, our next talk is from Gunnar Prusner. Um, Gunnar did his um, postdoc um, with the Schmidt, Tauber and Zier um, lab at Virginia Tech and a postdoc with Adrian Sutton in physics. Um, he was an RCUK fellow at the University of Warwick and is now a um, senior lecturer in the Department of Mathematics at Imperial and he leads the non-equilibrium systems group. So uh, please uh, over to you Gunnar. All right, thank you very much for the very nice introduction and Thanks to the organizers for giving me a chance to talk at this um, symposium. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a project that I recently finished with a former PhD student of mine, Ignacio Bordeaux, and I should also say he is um, the author of all of these slides. Um, this project was concerned with um, mouse embryonic stem cells, and you can see them here already, and they are interacting with microscopic beads as one. Um, and we wanted to try to cast the interaction between these uh, living cells and the inert matter in terms of um, the language of simple liquids. And um, so it was experimental work mostly conducted by Ignacio Bordeaux and Claire Garsin, and um, that happened mostly at um, King's College in the lab of Shukri Habib. So um, here are the key questions uh, that I'm asking. So we are trying to uh, cast the interactions of living systems in the language of inert matter. So we want to use um, the theory of simple liquids um, to understand, understand the interaction of cells and um, inert matter a little bit better. And um, so I should be more specific about what sort of inert matter I'm talking about. These are uh, beads that are covered in a protein um, that triggers a signaling pathway, so they're covered in uh, wind protein. And so uh, what really uh, lies at the uh, bottom of this, at the heart of this, is to understand the interaction between cells and signals better and try to cast that in terms of um, simple liquids. So we want to understand um, how the cells move, um, how they, they interact, how they change the environment, and um, uh, we, we try to find a good observable, and maybe you could look at this um, whole project as the um, as an attempt to find a very useful observable um, to um, characterize um, cell interactions. And um, while well, this observable should open a path to predictions, ideally to modeling, and of course to understand the biology a little bit better. So um, the, I was saying this is this is about signaling. Um, I know pretty much nothing about cell signaling. Um, there are various, uh, um, uh, I guess, um, gazillions of signaling pathways within a living cell, and we are focusing. Uh, well, here you can see a couple of very prominent ones. Uh, we are focusing on one of them. That's the wind pathway, and wind is involved. Um, so uh, wind is a protein, and that triggers. Um, a cascade of reactions within the cell and it's involved in development and stem cell maintenance and asymmetric cell division. The Habib lab is um, focusing precisely on this, on the asymmetric um, cell division and tissue patterning and of course it also plays a role in cancers. And I, um, I expose the cells or we expose the cells to the, um, the, this wind protein 
by um, in the form of beads um, that are very small, 2.8 micrometers, beads uh, that are covered in the protein. So there are cells on a, that are plated and they are um, subjected to these uh, wind proteins in the form of um, that the, these proteins being bound to beads. And we consider three different types of beads, namely the uncoated beads, which are, well, they are not totally uncoated, they're coated in the polymer. Um, they are coated by wind that should uh, trigger a reaction by the cells and or they are coated by uh, nothing, well, yeah. They are coated by inactive wind, so something that should not trigger a reaction. So we we will consider um, three different scenarios: one whereby beads react to uncoated beads when they are reacting to uh, wind-covered beads, and ones when they are reacting to inactive uh, wind. Okay. So um, here is a typical image of the cells um, uh, together with the beads. Uh, hang on, I've got some. Here we go. Here, here you can see the beads. A couple of uh, black spots there. Uh, there's a cell, and you can see that the c these cells come in different morphologies. They can be these nice little round ones or these elongated ones. It depends on what they are doing. They are wandering around on this substrate. Uh, the medium is um, set up so that they are being um, held in this embryonic um, state. So um, what they're doing is literally they wander around on the substrate. I've got a movie in a second. And as they wander around, they bump into the, these uh, beads. And when they um, find a bead with which they want to interact, um, they grab the bead and put them on their back, quite literally. So hang on, there's a movie. Okay, here we go. There's the movie. And if you watch here close to the center, I think this little guy here, that is going to take this black spot and puts 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 it on the back. So now they wander around. You, if you look closely, sort of do it this way. Okay. Uh, this is not very satisfying, but um, anyway, I think I I um everybody wants to move on, so um I try to do it this way, a bit improvised. If you get it going, then. Perfect. Maybe I'll try in a moment again. So um, I, well, I can only give you now the essence of it. Um, so these mouse embryonic stem cells interact with um, the beads um, and um, the interaction is time dependent. So there is an age of the experiment, so to say. And um, we can also consider a delay and I'm not going to discuss the delay because of the technical complications. So um, when we ask um, for the correlation functions, which is essentially a histogram of finding um, cells at a particular um, distance to their um, to the beats, um, we, we can we can create this histogram here and ask how it um, evolves um, as the system ages. So the, the cells wander around, they interact with the beads, and as they do, and they, the beat positions change. So we capture all of the, this oh, in this single function. Now everything seems to break down uh, in, the, in this single function. And um, this can be related to the theory of simple liquids uh, and the, taking the logarithm of it amounts to calculating an effective potential. So this goes back to Van Hoof, and um, this has all been um, looked at in the context of um, simple liquids. So um, this effective potential should show uh, no uh, interesting oops, detail if um, we are looking at um, a random distribution of beats, and that's being done here. So there's no profile whatsoever. It's a flat potential, which means that the beats are um, equally likely to sit anywhere in relationship to the cells. But um, if we uh, now add the cells and um, let them interact with the beats, then depending on um, the coating of the beads, depending on the coating of the beads, we see um, the evolution in time um, of a potential that can be um, has a dip initially, which means that um, beads are keen to sit close to the center of a cell, and uh, gets a ever deeper um, dip uh, as time 
goes by. So from here to here, I think I can't quite see it. It's about, I think, eight, eight hours or something like that, or four hours. I don't, I can't quite see it. So from here to here, a couple of hours pass, and as, as time goes by, um, the effective potential that the beads are seeing gets deeper. Uh, this is the case for the wind coated bead. For the um, inactive wind, we also see an interaction of the cells with the beads, but it's not quite as deep. So the effective potential um, that we devised shows a dip as time goes by, but it's not as pronounced as for the um, for the uh, the um, proper wind protein. And if we expose the cells to um, uncoated beads, then okay, there is some interaction but it's uh, very noisy and it doesn't um, evolve in time very much. So here you've got the three different uh, types of beats and how they evolve in time. Um, so we, we can, uh, maybe I shouldn't go to the, uh, to the delay. We can analyze this in great detail. And the idea is to build an observable that is accessible experimentally in simulations and in theory. And there's a, some sort of broader um, conceptual background to this particular function. And the idea is to use the tools of simple liquids to describe the interaction between cells and beads. So um, um, here, um, again, the three different scenarios. And I, I should briefly say, OK, you can calculate this um, second virial co coefficient, which captures whether the potential is attractive or repulsive. And I, I'm just going to uh, tell you that for the wind beat, for the proper interaction, you get strong interaction. For the um, inactive wind, you get slightly weaker interaction. So the color scheme is maybe a bit misleading. Yeah. And for um, the interaction between um, the uncoated beads and um, the, the cells, you get mostly repulsion. So we could capture all of this in this um, single observable. And um, well, we hope very much that um, we, we can use that to extract information about um, the biological um, relevance or biolog bio biological uh, activity, um, we, to use it in modeling and to, well, to find out in particular about specificity and se selectivity of the cells in um, relation to these different signals. Okay, I should leave it here. I apologize again for, for the um, technical difficulties. And uh, well, I'm happy to hear about any questions. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for persevering and uh, with uh, com coming up with a solution that worked in the end. And sorry about that. Um, so I can see that Andela Sarek has her hand up. Would you like to ask your quest the question directly? And you're on mute. Uh, and and Della, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? That's the sign language. Yes. Um, so, um, so if I understand correctly, I think Rob was asked. So there is a bead binding to the cell, and you're estimating free energy of these interactions. Gunnar, are you still there? The video is frozen. Uh, no, 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 it's not. Oh, my, I don't know whether they can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. OK, so I turn off the video just to um, maybe um, reduce the bandwidth. So, uh, so we are not estimating, it's not uh, as physics here as it might seem. So we're not estimating the free energy um, of the binding cell. We have to I'm interested in the microscopic of the interaction between cells and beads. What I want to do is the well, statistical mechanics of the um, internal mesoscopic scale. So we are just using these um, correlation functions as a, as a vehicle to uh, the effective potential is scale. It's not so this is the um, effective potential. I think the sound may be coming and going. And the whole equation. Uh, OK, I, I tried it. So the, in the Van Hoff equation there, you will see that there's a beta that's a 1 over kt. 
to equal to one. Right, because I think this is what the microscopic physics question. involved. Yeah. Uh, I didn't hear, but, but yeah, this is my question about what does KT mean in this case ah. and what's the reference states and so on. But okay, maybe next time we manage. Yeah, to I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not very happy, uh, lucky here right now with my internet connection. Do you want to try uh, your question, Robert? I mean, I can try, um, Gunnar, in case you can uh, still hear me. So I. Um, I was I was originally thinking you were probably talking about uh, field series in biology uh, because it would have been yeah sort of more provocative I guess. Do you want to say anything ab about just a just a sentence about said how you how you see the role of these very fundamental theories in in life science? <laughs> or have you given up on these already? Have you given up and that's why you talked about? It's my no, research. not at all, not at all. But I thought um, so. Uh, I thought this is um, a very um, it's a project that um, straddles uh, across uh, experiment and theory. So I thought there would be more people yeah. maybe um, interested about this. Um, no, the um, as far as the field theory is concerned, um, uh, not at all. I think uh, that's the way forward. But it's very difficult um, to make immediate contact with experiments. So I've got a couple of um, smaller projects where we try to use field theoretic techniques to understand um, experimental results a little bit better. But um, they, uh, I think as a fundamental theory, um, field theory is, uh, lends itself naturally to um, try to capture uh, many interacting degrees of freedom and um, when the renormalization group that Chufan was talking about is at home in that area. So yeah, I totally think that um, field theory is the way ahead. If we want to understand many interacting degrees of freedom, then field theory is the tool of choice, absolutely. Yeah. So there's a question from Keith Wollaston asking about how homogeneous is the bead coating? What happens if you vary the wind concentration on the bead surface? I, I don't think that is, so I'm, I'm not an expert in that. I don't think um, it's uh, really on the cards to um, uh, change the, the wind concentration on the beads. So one thing, one, one aspect of the beads is that they are um, covered in a, in a way that the uh, wind does not um, dissolve in the medium so that um, the cells are not following a gradient. The cells perform a random walk and then um, they um, stretch out their philopodia and, and bump and uh, touch a bead, so to say, and that elicits a response. Um, the um, changing the the coating, the physics of the coating, the concentration, and so on. Um, I suppose I don't know whether this is really um, doable. Whether you can maybe uh, coat the beads in a mixture and thereby dilute um, some of the wind. Um, I don't know, but we haven't really looked at this. Um, we only looked at these three different scenarios. OK, thank you. Uh, Keith, does that answer your question? Hopefully. I can also see that Robert and Andela both still have their hands up. I don't know if you would like to ask a further question. Yeah, Keith says yes. So I think mine is on excellent. Oh, OK. Andela, do you have a further question? I think maybe maybe that's uh, an act. Yes, it's gone. Oh, no. no. Um, Andela? I think maybe that's no, an act. from before. Thank you. Oh, OK. Great. Well, th thank you very much to, again to all of the speakers in, in our session. And I'll just hand over to, to Robert to uh, wrap up. So thank you very much. Oh, uh, you, Chris, you can you could have also said it, but it's fine. I just I didn't want to say very much. I just wanted to um, say you know thank you again to the speakers and uh, and and for all the the people attending and uh, to the organizers and the co-organizers and um, yeah in particular I thought it was really fun um, it's as I said it was an experiment and hopefully we can do this again maybe even in person that would be fantastic and um, if you want to stay informed please sign up for our mailing list on our network website we will upload the, the video hopefully soon. And yeah, so that's basically it for me. Yeah, thank you again for attending. Yeah, thank you, Robert, for your work for organizing it. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks, okay. bye. Good. Goodbye.